The Diamond Master by Jacques Futrell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you today by Don Larson. The Diamond Master by Jacques Futrell, Chapter One. The First Diamond. There were thirty or forty personally addressed letters, the daily heritage of the head of a great business establishment, and a plain yellow-wrapped package about the size of a cigarette box, some three inches long, two inches wide, and one inch deep. It was neatly tied with thin scarlet twine, and innocent of markings except for the superscription in a precise copperplate hand, and the smudge of the postmark across the ten-cent stamp in the upper right-hand corner. The imprint of the cancellation, faintly decipherable, showed that the package had been mailed at the Madison Square substation at half-past seven o'clock of the previous evening. Mr. Harry Latham, president and active head of the H. Latham Company, manufacturing jewelers in Fifth Avenue, found the letters and the package on his desk when he entered his private office a few minutes past nine o'clock. The simple fact that the package bore no return address or identifying mark of any sort caused him to pick it up and examine it, after which he shook it inquiringly. Then, with kindling curiosity, he snipped the scarlet thread with a pair of silver scissors and unfolded the wrappings. Inside was a glazed paper box, such as jewelers use, but still there was no mark, no printing, either on top or bottom. The cover of the box came off in Mr. Latham's hand, disclosing a bed of white cotton. He removed the downy upper layer, and there, there nestled against the snowy background, blazed a single splendid diamond of six, perhaps seven carats. Myriad colors played in its blue-white depths, sparkling, flashing, dazzling in the subdued light. Mr. Latham drew one long, quick breath, and walked over to the window to examine the stone in the full glare of day. A minute or more passed, a minute of wonder, admiration, allurement, but at last he ventured to lift the diamond from the box. It was perfect, so far as he could see, perfect in cutting and color and depth, prismatic, radiant, bewilderingly gorgeous. Its value? Even he could not offer an opinion. Only the appraisement of his expert would be worth listening to on that point. But one thing he knew instantly, in the million-dollar stock of precious stones stored away in the vaults of H. Latham Company, there was not one to compare with this. At length, as he stared at it fascinated, he remembered that he didn't know its owner, and for the second time he examined the wrappings the box inside and out, and finally he lifted out the lower layer of cotton, seeking a fugitive card or mark of some sort. Surely the owner of so valuable a stone would not be so careless as to send it this way, through the mail, unregistered, without some method of identification. Another sharp scrutiny of the box and cotton and wrappings left him in deep perplexity. Then another idea came. One of the letters, of course. The owner of the diamond had sent it this way, perhaps to be set, and had sent instructions under another cover. An absurd, even a reckless thing to do, but— And Mr. Latham attacked the heap of letters neatly stacked up in front of him. There were thirty-six of them, but not one even remotely hinted at diamonds. In order to be perfectly sure, Mr. Latham went through his mail a second time. Perhaps the letter of instructions had come addressed to the company, and had gone to the secretary, Mr. Flitcroft. He arose to summon Mr. Flitcroft from an adjoining room, then changed his mind long enough, carefully to replace the diamond in the box, and thrust the box into a pigeonhole of his desk. Then he called Mr. Flitcroft in. "'Have you gone through your morning mail?' Mr. Latham inquired of the secretary. Yes, he replied, I have just finished. Did you happen to come across a letter bearing on, that is, was there a letter today, or has there been a letter of instructions, as to a single large diamond which was to come, or had come, by mail? No, nothing, replied Mr. Flitcroft promptly, 
The only letter received today which referred to diamonds was a notification of a shipment from South Africa. Mr. Latham thoughtfully drummed on his desk. Well, I'm expecting some such letter, he explained. When it comes, please call it to my attention. Send my stenographer in. Mr. Flitcroft nodded and withdrew, and for an hour or more Mr. Latham was engrossed in the routine of correspondence. There was only an occasional glance at the box in the pigeonhole, and momentary fits of abstraction, to indicate an unabated interest and growing curiosity in the diamond. The last letter was finished, and the stenographer rose to leave. "'Please ask Mr. Zenke to come here,' Mr. Latham directed. And after a while Mr. Zenke appeared. He was a spare little man, with beady black eyes, bushy brows, and a sinister scar extending from the point of his chin across the right jaw. Mr. Zenke drew a salary of $25,000 a year from the H. Latham Company, and was worth twice that much. He was the diamond expert of the firm, and for five or six years his had been the final word as to quality and value. He had been a laborer in the South African diamond mines. The scar was an Asenge thrust about the time Cecil Rhodes' grip was first felt there. Later he was employed as an expert by Barney Barnado at Kimberley, and finally he went to London with Adolf Zeet. Mr. Latham nodded as he entered, and took the box from the pigeonhole. "'Here's something I'd like you to look at,' he remarked. Mr. Zenke removed the cover and turned the glittering stone out into his hand. For a minute or more he stood still examining it, as he turned and twisted it in his fingers, then walked over to a window, adjusted a magnifying glass in his left eye, and continued the scrutiny. Mr. Latham swung around in his chair and stared at him intently. "'It's the most perfect blue-white I've ever seen,' the expert announced at last. "'I dare say it's the most perfect in the world.' Mr. Latham arose suddenly and strode over to Mr. Zenke, who was twisting the jewel in his fingers, singling out, dissecting, studying the colorful flashes, measuring the facets with practiced eyes, weighing it on his fingertips, seeking a possible flaw. "'The cutting is very fine,' the expert went on. "'Of course I would have to use instruments to tell me if it is mathematically correct, and the weight, I imagine, is about six carats, perhaps a fraction more.' "'What's it worth?' asked Mr. Latham. "'Approximately, I mean.' "'We know the color is perfect,' explained Mr. Zenke precisely. "'If, in addition, the cutting is perfect, and the depth is right, and the weight is six carats or a fraction more, it's worth, in other words, if that is the most perfect specimen in existence, as it seems to be, it's worth whatever you might choose to demand for it. Twenty, twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars? With this color, and assuming it to be six carats, even if badly cut, it would be worth ten or twelve thousand? Mr. Latham mopped his brow, and this had come by mail, unregistered. It would not be possible to say where, where such a stone came from, what country? Mr. Latham inquired curiously. What's your opinion? The expert shook his head. "'If I had to guess, I should say Brazil, of course,' he replied. "'But that would be merely because the most perfect blue-white diamonds come from Brazil. They are found all over the world, in Africa, Russia, India, China, even in the United States. The simple fact that this color is perfect makes a conjecture useless.' Mr. Latham lapsed into silence and for a time paced back and forth across his office. Mr. Zenke stood waiting. "'Please get the exact weight,' Mr. Latham requested abruptly. "'Also test the cutting. It came into my possession in rather an unusual manner, and I'm curious.' The expert went out. An hour later he returned and placed the white glazed box on the desk before Mr. Latham. The weight is six and three-sixteenths carats, he stated. The depth is absolutely perfect according to the diameter of the girdle. 
The bezel facets are mathematically correct to the minutest fraction, 33, including the table. The facets on the collet side are equally exact, 25 including the collet, or 58 facets in all. As I said, the color is flawless. In other words, he continued without hesitation, I should say, speaking as an expert, that it is the most perfect diamond existing in the world today. Mr. Latham had been staring at him mutely, and he still sat silent for an instant after Mr. Zenke had finished. "'And its value?' he asked at last. "'Its value?' Mr. Zenke repeated musingly. "'You know, Mr. Latham,' he went on suddenly, "'there are a hundred experts commissioned by royalty scouring the diamond markets of the world for such stones as this.' So if you are looking for a sale and a price, by all means offer it abroad first. He lifted the sparkling iridescent jewel from the box again, and gazed at it reflectively. There is not one stone belonging to the British crown, for instance, which would in any way compare with this. Not even the koh nor Mr. Latham demanded, surprised. Mr. Zenke shook his head. Not even the koh nor it is larger, that's all, a fraction more than one hundred and six carats, but it has neither the coloring nor the cutting of this. There was a pause. Would it be impertinent if I asked who owns this? I don't know, replied Mr. Latham slowly. I don't know, but it isn't ours. Perhaps later I'll be able to— I beg your pardon, the expert interrupted courteously and there was a slight expression of surprise on his thin, scarred face. Is that all? Mr. Latham nodded absently, and Mr. Zenke left the room. End of Chapter 1 Chapter 2 Tweedledum and Tweedledee A little while later, when Mr. Latham started out to luncheon, he thrust the white-glazed box into an inside pocket. It had occurred to him that Schultz, Gustav Schultz, the greatest importer of precious stones in America, was usually at the club where he had luncheon. He found Mr. Schultz, a huge blond German, sitting at a table in an alcove alone, gazing out upon Fifth Avenue in deep abstraction, with perplexed wrinkles about his blue eyes. The German glanced around at Latham quickly, as he proceeded to draw out a chair on the opposite side of the table. "'Sit down, Latham, sit down,' he invited explosively. "'I have just sent for the waiter to telephone to ask you.' There was a restrained note of excitement in the German's voice, but at the moment it was utterly lost upon Mr. Latham. "'Schultz, you've probably imported more diamonds in the last ten years than any other half-dozen men in the United States,' he interrupted. "'I have something here I want you to see. Perhaps at some time it may have passed through your hands.' He placed the glazed box on the table. For an instant the German stared at it with amazed eyes, then one fat hand darted toward it, and he spilled the diamond out on the napkin in his plate. Then he sat gazing as if fascinated by the lambent, darting flashes deep from the blue-white heart. "'Mein Gott, Latham!' he exclaimed, and, with fingers which shook, he lifted the little stone and squinted through it toward the light with critical eyes. Mr. Latham was leaning forward on the table, waiting, watching, and listening. Well, he queried impatiently at last. Latham, it is a miracle, Mr. Schultz explained solemnly, with his characteristic whimsical philosophy. I have the duplicate of it, Latham. It's twin, it's little brother. See here? From an inner pocket he produced a glazed white box, identical with that which Mr. Latham had just set down, then carefully laid the cover aside. Look, Latham, look! Mr. Latham looked and gasped. Here was the counterpart of the mysterious diamond which still lay in Mr. Schultz's outstretched palm. They are twins, Latham, remarked the German quaintly, finally. It came by mail this morning, just like this, wrapped in paper but with no marks, no name, no nothing. It just came. With his right hand Mr. Latham lifted the duplicate diamond from its cotton bed, 
and with his left took the other from the German's hand. Then, side by side, he examined them. Color, diameter, depth, all seemed to be the same. "'Twins, I tell you,' repeated Mr. Schultz stolidly. "'Tweedledum and Tweedledee, born of the same mother and father. "'Latham, it is a miracle. "'They are the most beautiful in the world, just the pair of them. "'Have you made,' Mr. Latham began, "'and there was an odd, uncertain note in his voice, "'have you made an expert examination?' "'I have. "'I measured them, deepness, cutting, facets, and it's perfect. "'And I take my own judgment of a diamond, Latham.' before any man in the world, but Zanke. And the weight? Precisely six and three sixteenths carat. There is not more of a difference than thirty seconds between them. Mr. Latham regarded the importer steadily, the while he fought back an absurd, nervous thrill in his voice. There isn't that much, Schultz. Their weight is exactly the same. For a long time the two men sat staring at each other unseeingly. Finally the German, with a prodigious Teutonic sigh, replaced the diamond from Mr. Latham's right hand in one of the glazed boxes, and carefully stowed it away in a cavernous pocket. Mr. Latham mechanically disposed of the other in the same manner. "'Whose are they?' he demanded at length. "'Why are they sent to us like this?' with no name, no letter of explanation. Until I saw the stone you have, I believed this other had been sent to me by some careless fool for setting, perhaps, and that a letter would follow it. I merely brought it here on the chance that it was one of your importations and that you could identify it. But since you have received one under circumstances which seem to be identical, now, he paused helplessly, what does it mean? Mr. Schultz shrugged his huge shoulders and thoughtfully flicked the ashes from his cigar into the consomme. "'You know, Latham,' he said slowly, "'they don't pick up diamonds like those on the street corners. I don't believe there was a stone of such bigness in the United States whose owner I didn't know it was. Those that are here I have brought here myself, mostly. Those I did not I kept track of. I don't know, Latham. I don't know.' The longer I live, the more I don't know. The two men completed a scant luncheon in silence. Obviously, remarked Mr. Latham, as he laid his napkin aside, the diamonds were sent to us by the same person. Obviously, they were sent to us with a purpose. Obviously, we will in time hear from the person who sent them. Obviously, they were intended to be perfectly matched. So, let's see if they are. "'Come to my office and let Zenki examine the one you have.' He hesitated an instant. "'Suppose you let me take it. We'll try a little experiment.' He carefully placed the jewel which the German handed to him in an outside pocket, and together they went to his office. Mr. Zenki appeared in answer to a summons, and Mr. Latham gave him the German's box. "'That's the diamond you examined for me this morning, isn't it?' he inquired. Mr. Zenke turned it out into his hand and scrutinized it perfunctorily. Yes, he replied after a moment. Are you quite certain? Mr. Latham insisted. Something in the tone caused Mr. Zenke to raise his beady black eyes questioningly for an instant, after which he walked over to a window and adjusted his magnifying glass again. For a moment or more he stood there, then... "'It's the same stone,' he announced positively. "'It's a miracle, Latham, when Zenki makes a mistake,' the German exploded suddenly. "'Show him the other one.' Mr. Zenki glanced from one to the other, with a quick, inquisitive glance. Then, without a word, Mr. Latham produced the second box and opened it. The expert stared incredulously at the two perfect stones, and finally, placing them side by side on a sheet of paper, returned to the window and sat down. Mr. Latham and Mr. Schultz stood beside him, looking on curiously, as he turned and twisted the jewels under his powerful glass. "'As a matter of fact,' asked Mr. Latham pointedly at last, "'you would not venture to say which of these stones it was you examined this morning, would you?' 
No, replied Mr. Zanke curtly, not without weighing them. And if the weight is identical? No, said Mr. Zanke again. If the weight is the same, there is not the minutest fraction of a difference between them. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 Thursday at 3 Mr. Latham ran through his afternoon mail with feverish haste and found nothing. Mr. Schultz achieved the same result more ponderously. On the following morning the mail still brought nothing. About eleven o'clock Mr. Latham's desk telephone rang. "'Come to my office,' requested Mr. Schultz in guttural excitement. "'Mine got, Latham. Come to my office, and bring the diamond.' Mr. Latham went. Including himself, there were the heads of the five greatest jewelry establishments in America, representing, perhaps, one-tenth of the diamond trade of the country, in Mr. Schultz's office. He found the other four gathered around a small table, and on this table, Mr. Latham gasped as he looked, lay four replicas of the mysterious diamond in his pocket. "'Put it down here, Latham,' directed Mr. Schultz. They are all twins, all alike, Tweedledums and Tweedledees. Mr. Latham silently placed the fifth diamond on the table, and for a minute or more the five men stood still and gazed, first at the diamonds, then at one another, and then again at the diamonds. Mr. Solomon, the crisply spoken head of Solomon Berger and Company, broke the silence. These all came yesterday morning by mail, one to each of us, "'Just as the one came to you,' he informed Mr. Latham. "'Mr. Harris here, of Harris and Blacklock, "'learned that I had received such a stone, "'and brought the one he had received for comparison. "'We made some inquiries together "'and found that a duplicate had been received by "'Mr. Stoddard of Hall Stoddard Higginson. "'The three of us came here to see if Mr. Schultz "'could give us any information, and he telephoned for you.' "'Mr. Latham listened blankly.' "'It's positively beyond belief,' he burst out. "'What—what what does it mean?' "'It means,' the German importer answered philosophically, "'that if diamonds like these keep popping up like this, "'in another three months they will not be worth more than five cents a bucketful.' "'The truth of the observation came to the four others simultaneously. "'Hitherto there had been only the sense of wonder and admiration.' Now came the definite knowledge that diamonds, even of such great size and beauty as these, would grow cheap if they were to be picked out of the void, and realization of this astonishing possibility brought five shrewd business brains to a unit of investigation. First it was necessary to find how many other jewelers had received duplicates, then it was necessary to find whence they came. A plan was adopted, and an investigation ordered to begin at once. "'There is something back of it, of course,' declared Mr. Schultz. "'What is it? They are not being sent for our health.' During the next six days, half a score of private detectives were at work on the mystery, with the slender clues at hand. They scanned hotel registers, quizzed paper-box manufacturers, pestered stamp clerks, bedeviled postal officials, and the sum total of their knowledge was negative, save in the fact that they established beyond question that only these five men had received the diamonds. And meanwhile, the heads of the five greatest jewel houses in New York were assiduous in their search for that copperplate superscription in their daily mail. On the morning of the eighth day it came— Mr. Latham was nervously shuffling unopened personal correspondence when he came upon it, a formal white square envelope directed by that same copper-plate hand which had directed the boxes. He dropped into his chair and opened the envelope with eager fingers. Inside was this letter. My dear sir, one week ago I took the liberty of sending you and to each of the four other leading jewelers of this city, whose names you know, a single large diamond of rare cutting and color. Please accept this as a gift from me, and be good enough to convey my compliments to the other four gentlemen, and assure them that theirs too were gifts. Believe me, I had no intention of making a mystery of this. It was necessary definitely to attract your attention, 
and I could conceive of no more certain way than in this manner. In return for the value of the jewels I shall ask that you, and the four others concerned, give me an audience in your office on Thursday afternoon next, at three o'clock, that you make known this request to the others, and that the three experts whose judgment you will all accept shall meet with us. I believe you will appreciate the necessity of secrecy in this matter, for the present at least. Respectfully, E. Van Cortland, Wynne. They were on hand promptly, all of them, Mr. Latham, Mr. Schultz, Mr. Solomon, Mr. Stoddard, and Mr. Harris. The experts agreed upon were the unemotional Mr. Zenke, Mr. Cawthorne, an Englishman in the employ of Solomon, Berger, and Company, and Mr. Schultz, who gravely admitted that he was the first expert in the land, after Mr. Zenke, and whose opinion of himself was unanimously accepted by the others. The meeting-place was the director's room of the H. Latham Company. At one minute of three o'clock a clerk entered with a card and handed it to Mr. Latham. Mr. E. Van Cortland Wynne, Mr. Latham read aloud, and every man in the room moved a little in his chair. Then, show him in here, please. Now, gentlemen, observed Mr. Schultz sententiously, we shall see what we shall see. The clerk went out, and a moment later Mr. Wynne appeared. He was tall and rather slender, alert of eyes, graceful of person, perfectly self-possessed, and sure of himself, yet without one trace of egotism in his manner or appearance, a fair type of the brisk, courteous young businessman in New York. He wore a tweed suit, and in his left hand carried a small sole-leather grip. For an instant he stood, framed by the doorway meeting the sharp scrutiny of the assembled jewelers with a frank smile. For a little time no one spoke, merely gazed, and finally, "'Mr. Latham?' queried Mr. Wynne, looking from one to the other. Latham came to his feet with a sudden realization of his responsibilities as temporary host, and introductions followed. Mr. Wynne passed along on one side of the table, shaking hands with each man in turn, until he came to Mr. Zenke. Mr. Latham introduced them. "'Mr. Zenke,' repeated Mr. Wynne, and he allowed his eyes to rest frankly upon the expert for a moment. "'Your name has been repeated to me so often that I almost feel as if I knew you.' Mr. Zenke bowed without speaking. "'I am assuming that this is the Mr. Zenke who was associated with Mr. Bernardo and Mr. Zeet,' the young man went on. "'That is correct, yes,' replied the expert. "'And I believe, too, that you once did some special work for Professor Henry Moisson in Paris?' Mr. Zenke's black eyes seemed to be searching the other's face for an instant, and then he nodded affirmatively. "'I made some tests for him, yes,' he volunteered. Mr. Wynne passed along the other side of the long table and stopped at the end. Mr. Latham was at his right, Mr. Schultz at his left, and Mr. Zenke sat at the far end facing him. The small sole-leather grip was on the floor at Mr. Wynne's feet. For a moment he permitted himself to enjoy the varying expressions of interest on the faces around the table. "'Gentlemen,' he began, then, "'you all probably have seen my letter to Mr. Latham, or at least you are aware of its contents.' so you understand that the diamonds which were mailed to you are your property. I am not an elemoisonary institution for the relief of diamond merchants, and he smiled a little, for the gifts are preliminary to a plain business proposition, a method of concentrating your attention, and, in themselves, part payment, if I may say it, for any worry or inconvenience which followed upon their appearance. There are only five of them in the world, they are precisely alike, and they are yours. I beg of you to accept them with my compliments. Mr. Schultz tilted his chair back a little, the better to study the young man's countenance. I am going to make some remarkable statements, the young man continued, but each of these statements is capable of demonstration here and now. Don't hesitate to interrupt if there is a question in your mind, because everything I shall say is vital to each of you, 
as bearing on the utter destruction of the world's traffic in diamonds. It is coming, gentlemen, it is coming, just as inevitably as the night follows the day, unless you stop it. You can stop it by concerted action in a manner which I shall explain later. He paused and glanced along the table. Only the face of Mr. Zenke was impassive. Since the opening of the fields in South Africa, Mr. Wynne resumed quietly, something like five hundred million dollars worth of diamonds have been found there, and we'll say arbitrarily that all the other diamond fields of the world, including Brazil and Australia, have produced another five hundred million dollars worth. In other words, since about 1868, a billion dollars worth of diamonds have been placed on the market. Gentlemen, that represents millions and millions of carats, forty, fifty, sixty million carats in the rough, say. Please bear those figures in mind a moment. Now, suddenly, and as yet secretly, the diamond output of the world has been increased fifty-fold. That is, gentlemen, within the year I can place another billion dollars worth of diamonds at the prices that hold now, in the open market, and within still another year, I can place still another billion in the market, and on, and on, indefinitely. To put it differently, I have found the unlimited supply. Mein Gott! Where is it? demanded the German breathlessly. Heedless of the question, Mr. Wynne leaned forward on the table, and gazed with half-closed eyes into the faces before him. Incredulity was the prominent expression and coupled with that was amazement. Mr. Harris, with quite another emotion displaying itself on his face, pushed back his chair as if to rise. A slight wrinkle in the brow was all the evidence of interest displayed by Mr. Zanke. "'I am not crazy, gentlemen,' Mr. Wynne went on after a moment, and the perfectly normal voice seemed to reassure Mr. Harris, for he sat still. "'The diamonds are now in existence,' untold millions of dollars worth of them, but there is the tedious work of cutting. They're in existence, packed away as you pack potatoes. I thrust my two hands into the bag and bring them out full of stones as perfect as the ones I sent you. He straightened up again, and the deep earnestness of his face relaxed a little. I believe you said, Mr. Wynne, that you could prove any assertion you might make, "'Here and now?' suggested Mr. Latham coldly. "'It occurs to me that such extraordinary statements as those demand immediate proof.' Mr. Wynne turned and smiled at him. "'You are quite right,' he agreed. And then, to all of them, "'It's hardly necessary to dwell upon the value of colored diamonds, the rarest and the most precious of all, the perfect rose color, the perfect blue, and the perfect green.' He drew a small glazed white box from his pocket and opened it. "'Please be good enough to look at this, Mr. Zenke. He spun a rosily glittering object some three-quarters of an inch in diameter along the table toward Mr. Zenke. It flamed and flashed as it rolled, with that deep iridescent blaze which left no doubt of what it was. Every man at the table arose and crowded about Mr. Zenke who held a flame-like sphere in his outstretched palm for their inspection. There was a tense, breathless instant. "'It's a diamond,' remarked Mr. Zenke, as if he himself had doubted it, a deep rose color cut as a perfect sphere. "'It's worth half a million dollars if it's worth a cent!' exclaimed Mr. Solomon almost fiercely. "'And this, please,' Mr. Wynne, from the other end of the table, spun another glittering sphere toward them, this as brilliantly, softly green as the verdure of early spring, prismatic, gleaming, radiant. Mr. Zenke's beady eyes snapped as he caught it and held it out for the others to see, and some strange emotion within caused him to close his teeth savagely. "'And this,' said Mr. Wynne again, and a third sphere rolled along the table." This was blue, elusively blue as a moonlit sky, 
Its rounded sides caught the light from the windows and sparked it back. And now the three jewels lay side by side in Mr. Zenke's open hand, the while the five greatest diamond merchants of the United States glutted their eyes upon them. Mr. Latham's face went deadly white from sheer excitement, the Germans violently red from the same emotion, and the others? There was amazement, admiration, awe in them. Mr. Zenke's countenance was again impassive. End of Chapter 3 Chapter 4 The Unlimited Supply If you will all be seated again, please, requested Mr. Wynne, who still stood cool and self-certain at the end of the table. The sound of his voice brought a returning calm to the others, and they resumed their seats, all save Mr. Cawthorne, who walked over to a window with the three spheres in his hand, and stood there examining them under his glass. "'You gentlemen know, of course, the natural shape of the diamond in the rough,' Mr. Wynne resumed questioningly. "'Here are a dozen specimens which may interest you. The octahedron, the rhombic dodecahedron, the triacosoctahedron, and the hexacosoctahedron. He spread them along the table with a sweeping gesture of his hand, colorless, inert pebbles, ranging in size from a pea to a peanut. And now, you ask, where do they come from? The others nodded unanimously. I'll have to state a fact that you all know, as part answer to the question, replied Mr. Wynne. A perfect diamond is a perfect diamond, no matter where it comes from, Africa, Brazil, India, or New Jersey. There is not the slightest variation in value if the stone is perfect. That being true, it is a matter of no concern to you as dealers where these come from. Sufficient it is that they are here, and being here, they bring you to the necessity of concerted action to uphold the diamond as a thing of value. You said the world's output had been increased fiftyfold, suggested Mr. Schultz. Do we understand you prove it by these? The young man smiled slightly and drew a leather packet from an inner pocket. He stripped it of several rubber bands and then turned to Mr. Zenke again. Mr. Zenke, I have been told that a few years ago you had an opportunity of examining the Kohinoor. Is that correct? Yes. I believe the Kohinoor was temporarily removed from its setting, and that you were one of three experts to whom was entrusted the task of selecting four stones of the identical coloring to be set alongside it? That is correct, Mr. Zenke agreed. You held the Kohinoor in your hand, and you would be able to identify it? I would be able to identify it, said Mr. Cawthorn positively. He had turned at the window quickly. It was the first time he had spoken. Mr. Wynne walked around the table to Mr. Zenke and approached Mr. Cawthorn. Suppose, then, you gentlemen examine this together, suggested Mr. Wynne. He lifted a great glittering jewel from the leather packet and held it aloft that all might see. Then he carefully placed it on the table in front of the experts, and the others came to their feet and stood gazing as if fascinated. "'By Jove!' exclaimed Mr. Cawthorn. For a minute or more the two experts studied the huge diamond, one hundred and six carats and a fraction, beneath their glasses, and finally Mr. Cawthorn picked it up and led the way toward the window. Mr. Zenke and the German followed him. Gentlemen, and Mr. Cawthorn now turned sharply to face the others, this is the Kohinoor. Mr. Zenke didn't mention it, but I was one of the three experts who had the opportunity to examine the Kohinoor. This is the Kohinoor. Startled, questioning eyes were turned upon Mr. Wynne. He was smiling. There was a question in his face as he regarded Mr. Zenke. "'It is either the Kohinoor or an exact duplicate,' said Mr. Zenke. "'It is the Kohinoor," repeated Mr. Cawthorn doggedly. "'It seems to me,' interposed Mr. Schultz, "'that if the Kohinoor was missing, somebody would have heard of it. 
I have not heard. Mr. Zenke made a mistake the other day. Maybe you did it today. You have made a mistake, I assure you, Mr. Cawthorn, remarked Mr. Wynne quietly. You identify that as the Koh-i-Noor, of course, by a slight inaccuracy in one of the facets adjoining the collet. That inaccuracy is known to every diamond expert. The mistake you make is a compliment to that as a replica. He resumed his position at the end of the table, and Mr. Schultz sat beside him. Amazement was a thing of the past as far as he was concerned. Mr. Zenke dropped into his chair again. And now, Mr. Zenke, speaking as an expert, what would you say was the most perfect diamond in the world? asked Mr. Wynne. The five blue-white stones you mailed to these gentlemen, replied the expert without hesitation. "'Perhaps I should have specified the most perfect diamond known to the world at large,' Mr. Wynne added smilingly. "'The Regent.' Again Mr. Cawthorn looked round with bewilderment in his eyes. The others nodded their approval of Mr. Zenke's opinion. "'The Regent, yes,' Mr. Wynne agreed. "'One hundred and thirty-six and three-quarter carats, cut as a brilliant, worn by Napoleon in his sword-hilt, now in the Louvre at Paris, the property of the French government, valued at two and a half million dollars. His hand disappeared into the leather packet again, poised on his fingertips. When he withdrew them, there was another huge jewel. He dropped it into Mr. Schultz's hand. There is further proof that the diamond output has increased fiftyfold. Mr. Schultz seemed dazed as he turned and twisted the diamond in his hand. After a moment he passed it on down the table without a word. A duplicate also, and Mr. Wynne glanced at Mr. Cawthorn. It is reasonably certain that you would have heard of that if it had disappeared from the Louvre. He turned to Mr. Schultz again. I may add that this fiftyfold increase in output is not confined to small stones he went on tauntingly. They are of all sizes and values. For instance, he lifted still another jewel from the packet and held it aloft for an instant. The Orloff! gasped Mr. Solomon. No, the young man corrected. This, too, is a duplicate. The original is in the Russian scepter. This is a replica, color, weight, and cutting being identical, one hundred and ninety-three carats, nearly as large as a pigeon's egg. Again Mr. Wynne glanced along the table. Suddenly the frank amazement had vanished from the faces of these men, and he found only the tense interest of an audience watching a clever juggler. For a time Mr. Schultz studied the Orloff duplicate, then passed it along to the others. The Grand Cullinan diamond weighs only two or three pounds, he questioned in a tone of deep resignation. Maybe you have it in your package already? Not yet, replied Mr. Wynne, but I may possibly get that on my next trip out. Who knows? There was a long, tense silence. Mechanically, Mr. Zenke placed the three spheres and the replicas in an orderly little row upon the table in front of him and the uncut stones beside them. Six, seven, eight million dollars worth of diamonds. "'Gentlemen, are you convinced?' demanded Mr. Wynne suddenly. "'Is there one lingering doubt in any mind here as to the tremendous find which makes the production of all these possible?' "'It is a miracle, Mr. Wynne,' admitted the German gravely after a little pause. There is something before us, as there never was in the world, I am convinced. Up to this moment, gentlemen, the De Beers Syndicate had controlled the diamond market, Mr. Wynne announced. But now, from this moment, I control it. I hold it there, in the palm of my hand, with the unlimited supply back of me. I am offering you an opportunity to prevent the annihilation of the market. It rests with you. If I turn loose a billion dollars' worth of diamonds within the year, you are ruined, all of you. You know that it's hardly necessary to tell you, and, gentlemen, I don't care to do it. What is your proposition? 
queried Mr. Latham quietly. His face was ghastly white. Haggard lines, lined by amazement and realization, were marked clearly on it. "'What is your proposition?' he repeated. "'Wait a minute,' interposed Mr. Solomon protestingly, and he turned to the young man. The syndicate controls the market by force of the reserve stock of ten or fifteen million dollars. Do we understand that you have more than these ready for market now? Mr. Wynne stooped and lifted a small sole leather grip, which had been unheated on the floor. He unfastened the catch and turned the bag upside down upon the table. When he raised it again, the assembled jewelers gazed upon a spectacle unknown and undreamed of in the history of the world a great glittering heap of diamonds flashing colorful prismatic radiant bedazzling they rattled like pebbles upon the mahogany table as they slipped and slid one against another and then at rest resolved themselves into a steady multicolored blaze which was almost blinding now gentlemen on the table before you there are about thirty million dollars worth of diamonds mr wynne announced calmly they are all perfect every one of them and they're mine i know where they come from you can't find out it's none of your business are you satisfied now mr latham looked looked until his eyes seemed bursting from his head and then with an inarticulate little cry fell forward on the table with his face on his arms. The German importer came to his feet with one vast Teutonic oath, then sat down again. Mr. Solomon plunged his hand into the blazing heap and laughed senselessly. The others were silent, stunned, overcome. Mr. Wynne walked around the table and replaced the spheres and replicas in his pocket, after which he resumed his former position. "'I have stated my case, gentlemen,' he continued quietly, very quietly. "'Now for my proposition. "'Briefly, it is this. "'For a consideration I will destroy the unlimited supply. "'I will bind myself to secrecy, as you must. "'I will guarantee that no stone from the same source "'is ever offered in the market privately.' while you gentlemen, and his manner was emphatically deliberate, purchase from me, at one half the carat price you now pay, one hundred million dollars worth of diamonds. He paused. There was not a sound. No one moved. You may put them on the market as you may agree. Slowly, thus preventing any material fluctuation in value, he went on, how to hold this tremendous reserve secretly and still permit the operation of the other diamond mines of the world is the great problem you will have to face. He leaned over, picked up a handful from the heap, and replaced them in the leather bag. The others he swept off into it, then snapped the lock. I will give you one week to decide what you will do, he said in conclusion. If you accept the proposition, then six weeks from next Thursday at three o'clock, I shall expect a cash payment of ten million dollars for a portion of the stones now cut and ready. Within a year all the diamonds will have been delivered and the transaction must be closed. He hesitated an instant. I'm sorry, gentlemen, if the terms seem hard, but I think after consideration you will agree that I have done you a favor by coming to you instead of going into the market and destroying it. I will call next Thursday at three for your answer. That is all. Good day. The door opened and closed behind him. A minute, two minutes, three minutes passed, and no one spoke. At last the German came to his feet slowly, with a sigh. Anyhow, gentlemen, he remarked, that young man has a hell of a load of diamonds, ain't it? End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 The Astute Mr. Burns 
It was a few minutes past four o'clock when Mr. Wynne strode through the immense retail sales department of the H. Latham Company, and a uniformed page held open the front door for him to pass out. Once on the sidewalk, the self-styled diamond master of the world paused long enough to pull on his gloves, carelessly chucking the small sole leather grip with its twenty-odd million dollars' worth of precious stones under one arm. Then he turned up Fifth Avenue, toward Thirty-fourth Street. A sneak thief brushed past him, appraised him with one furtive glance, then went his way, seeking quarry more promising. Simultaneously with Mr. Wynne's appearance, three men whose watchful eyes had been fastened on the doorway of the H. Latham Company for something more than an hour stirred. One of them, Frank Claflin, was directly across the street, strolling along idly, the most purposeless of all in the hurrying, well-dressed throng. Another, Steve Burns, chief of the Burns Detective Agency, appeared from the hallway of a building adjoining the H. Latham Company, and moved along behind Mr. Wynne, some thirty feet in the rear. The third, Jerry Malone, was half a block away up Fifth Avenue, coming slowly toward them. Mr. Burns adjusted his pace to that of Mr. Wynne, step for step, and then, seeming assured of his safety from any chance glance, ostentatiously mopped his face with a handkerchief, flirting it a little to the left as he replaced it in his pocket. Claflin, across the street, understood from that that he was to go on up Fifth Avenue to Thirty-fourth Street, the next intersection, and turn west to board any crosstown car which Mr. Wynne might possibly take. And a cabby, who had been sitting motionless on his box down the street, understood from it that he was to move slowly along behind Mr. Burns, and be prepared for an emergency. Halfway between 33rd and 34th Streets, Jerry Malone approached and passed Mr. Wynne without so much as a glance at him, and went on toward his chief. "'Drop in behind here,' Mr. Burns remarked crisply to Malone, without looking around. "'I'll walk on ahead and turn east in 34th Street to nail him if he swings a car.' Claflin's got him going west. Mr. Wynne was perhaps some twenty feet from the corner of 34th Street and 5th Avenue when Mr. Burns passed him. His glance lingered on the broad back of the chief reflectively as he swung by and turned into the cross street after a quick, business-like glance at an approaching car. Then Mr. Wynne smiled. He paused on the edge of the curb long enough for an automobile to pass, then went on across 34th Street to the uptown side, and, turning flatly, looked Mr. Burns over pensively, after which he leaned up against an electric pole and scribbled something on an envelope. A closed cab came wriggling and squirming up Fifth Avenue. As it reached the middle of 34th Street, Mr. Wynne raised his hand, and the cab drew up beside him. He said something to the driver, opened the door, and stepped in. Mr. Burns smiled confidently. So that was it, eh? He too crossed 34th Street and lifted his hand. The cab which had been drifting along behind him immediately came up. Now, Jimmy, get on the job, instructed Mr. Burns as he stepped in. Keep that chap in sight, and when he stops, you stop. Mr. Wynne's cab jogged along comfortably up the avenue, twisting and winding a path between the other vehicles. The while Mr. Burns regarded it with a thoughtful gaze. Its number dangling on a white board in the rear, Mr. Burns just happened to note it. Grand Central Station, I'll bet a hat, he mused. But the closed cab didn't turn into 42nd Street. It went past, then on past Delmonico's, past the Cathedral, past the Plaza, at 59th Street, and still on uptown. It was not hurrying. It merely moved along steadily, but once free of the snarl which culminates at the 59th Street entrance to Central Park, its speed increased a little. Past 64th Street, 65th, 66th, and 67th, it slowed up and halted at the sidewalk, on the far side. "'Stop in front of a door, Jimmy,' directed the detective hastily. Jimmy obeyed gracefully, and Mr. Burns stepped out, hardly half a block behind the closed cab. 
he went through an elaborate pretense of paying Jimmy, the while he regarded Mr. Wynne, who had also alighted and was paying the driver. The small sole leather grip was on the ground between his feet as he ransacked his pocket. A settlement was reached, the cabby nodded, touched his horse with his whip, and continued to jog up Fifth Avenue. Now, he didn't order that chap to come back or wouldn't have paid him, the detective reasoned. Therefore, he's close to where he is going. But Mr. Wynne seemed in no hurry. Instead, he stood for a minute gazing after the retreating vehicle, which fact made it necessary for Mr. Burns to start a dispute with Jimmy as to show how much the fare should be. They played the scene admirably. Had Mr. Wynne been listening, he might even have heard part of the vigorous argument. Whether he listened to the argument or not, he turned and gazed straight at Mr. Burns, until finally the detective recognized the necessity of getting out of sight. With a final explosion he handed a bill to Jimmy and turned to go up the steps of the house. He had no business there, but he must do something. Jimmy turned the cab short and went rattling away down Fifth Avenue to await orders in the lee of a corner a block or so away. And meanwhile, as Mr. Wynne still stood on the corner, Mr. Burns had to go on up the steps. But as he placed his foot on the third step he knew, though he had not looked, apparently, yet he knew, that Mr. Wynne had raised his hand, and that in that hand was a small white envelope. And further he knew that Mr. Wynne was gazing directly at him. Now that was odd. Slowly it began to dawn upon the detective that Mr. Wynne was trying to attract his attention. If he heeded the signal, evidently it was intended as such, it would be a confession that he was following Mr. Wynne, and, realizing this, he took two more steps up. Mr. Wynne waved the envelope again, after which he folded it across twice and thrust it into a crevice of a water-plug beside him. Then he turned east along 67th Street and disappeared. The detective had seen the performance, all of it, and he was perplexed. It was wholly unprecedented. However, the first thing to do now was to keep Mr. Wynne in sight, so he came down the steps and walked rapidly on to 67th Street, pausing to peer around the corner before he turned. Mr. Wynne was idling along half a block away, without the slightest apparent interest in what was happening behind. Inevitably, Mr. Burns' eyes were drawn to the water-plug across the street. A tag end of white paper gleamed tantalizingly. Now what the deuce did it mean? Being only human, Mr. Burns went across the street and got the paper. It was an envelope. As he unfolded it and gazed at the address written in pencil, his mouth opened in undignified astonishment. It was addressed to him. Steve Burns, chief of the Burns Detective Agency. Mr. Wynne had still not looked back, so the detective trailed along behind, opening the envelope as he walked. A note inside ran briefly. My address is number blank, East 37th Street. If it is necessary for you to see me, please call there about six o'clock this afternoon. E. Van Cortland Wynne. Now here was, perhaps, as savory a kettle of fish as Mr. Burns had ever stumbled upon. It is difficult to imagine a more embarrassing situation for a professional sleuth than to find himself suddenly taken into the confidence of the person he was shadowing. But was he being taken into Mr. Wynne's confidence? Ah, that was the question. Admitting that Mr. Wynne knew who he was, and, admitting that he knew he was being followed, was not this apparent frankness an attempt to throw him off the scent? He would see, would Mr. Burns. He quickened his pace a little, then slowed up instantly, because Mr. Wynne had stopped on the corner of Madison Avenue, and, as a downtown car came rushing along, he stepped on to board it. Mr. Burns scuttled across the street, and by a dexterous jump swung on the car as it fled past. Mr. Wynne had gone forward and was taking a seat. Mr. Burns remained on the back platform, sheltered by the accommodating bulk of a fat man, and flattered himself that Mr. Wynne had not seen him. 
By peering over the huge shoulder, the detective was still able to watch Mr. Wynne. He saw him pay his fare, and then he saw him place the small sole-leather grip on his knees and unfasten the catch. Not knowing what was in that grip, Mr. Burns was curious to see what came out of it. Nothing came out of it. It was empty. There was no question of this, for Mr. Wynne opened it wide and turned it upside down to shake it out. It didn't mean anything in particular to Mr. Burns, the fact that the grip was empty, so he didn't get excited about it. Mr. Wynne left the car at 34th Street, the south end of the Park Avenue tunnel, by the front door, and the detective stepped off the rear end. Mr. Wynne brushed past him as he went up the stairs, and as he did so, he smiled a little, a very little. He walked up Park Avenue to 37th Street, turned in there, and entered a house about the middle of the block with a latch key. The detective glanced at the number of the house and felt aggrieved. It was the number that was written in the note. And Mr. Wynne had entered with a key, which meant, in all probability, that he did live there, as he had said. But why did he take that useless cab ride up Fifth Avenue? If he had no objection to anyone knowing his address, why did he go so far out of his way? Mr. Burns couldn't say. As he pondered these questions, he saw a maidservant come out of the house adjoining that which Mr. Wynne had entered, and he went up boldly to question her. Did Mr. Wynne live next door? Yes. How long had he lived there? Five or six months. Did he own the house? No, the people who owned the house had gone to Europe for a year and had rented it furnished. No, Mr. Wynne didn't have a family. He lived there alone except for two servants, a cook and a housemaid. She had never noticed anything unusual about Mr. Wynne or the servants or the house. Yes, he went out every day downtown to business. No, she didn't know what his business was, but she had an idea that he was a broker. That was all. From a nearby telephone booth, the detective detailed Claflin and Malone, who had returned to the office to keep a sharp watch on the house, after which he walked on to Fifth Avenue, and down Fifth Avenue to the establishment of H. Latham Company. Mr. Latham would see him, yes. In fact, Mr. Latham, harried by the events of the past two hours, bewildered by a hundred-million-dollar diamond deal, which had been thrust down his throat gracefully, but none the less certainly, and ridden by the keenest curiosity, was delighted to see Mr. Burns. "'I've got his house address all right,' Mr. Burns boasted in the beginning. Of course it was against the ethics of the profession to tell how he got it. "'Progress already,' commented Mr. Latham with keen interest. "'That's good.' Then the detective detailed the information he had received from the maid, adding thereto diverse and sundry conclusions of his own. Mr. Latham marveled exceedingly. "'He tried to shake us all right when he went out,' Mr. Burns went on to explain, "'but the trap was set and there was no escape.' With certain minor omissions, he told of the cab ride to 67th Street, the trip across to a downtown car, and, as a matter of convincing circumstantial detail, added the incident of the empty gripsack. "'Empty?' repeated Mr. Latham, startled. "'Empty, did you say?' "'Empty is a bass drum,' the detective assured him complacently. He turned it upside down and shook it out. "'Then what became of them?' demanded Mr. Latham. "'What became of what?' "'The diamonds, man. What became of the diamonds?' "'You didn't mention any diamonds to me except those five the other day,' the detective reminded him coldly. "'Your instructions were to find out all about this man, who he is, what he does, where he goes, and the rest. This is my preliminary report. You didn't mention diamonds.' "'I didn't know he would have them,' Mr. Latham exploded irascibly. "'That empty gripsack, man!' When he left here, he carried millions, I mean a great quantity, of diamonds in it. A great quantity of... The detective began, and then he sat up straight in his chair and stared at Mr. Latham in bewilderment. If the gripsack was empty when he was on the car, Mr. Latham rushed on excitedly, 
then don't you see he got rid of the diamonds somehow from the time he left here until you saw the gripsack was empty how did he get rid of them where does he keep them and where does he get them mr burns closed his teeth grimly and his eyes snapped now he knew why mr wynne had taken that useless cab ride up fifth avenue it was to enable him to get rid of the diamonds there was an accomplice in detective parlance the second person is always an accomplice in that closed cab it had all been prearranged mr wynne had deliberately made a monkey of him stephen burns reluctantly the detective permitted himself to remember that he didn't know whether there was any one in that cab when mr wynne entered it and and then he remembered that he did know one thing the number of the cab he arose abruptly with the light of great determination in his face whose diamonds were they he demanded they were his as far as we know replied mr latham how much were they worth mr latham looked him over thoughtfully i am not at liberty to tell you that mr burns he said at last there are a great number of them and they are worth they are worth a large sum of money and they are all unset that's enough for you to know i think it seemed to be quite enough for mr burns to know it may be that i will have something further to report this evening he told mr latham if not i'll see you to-morrow here he went out ten minutes later he was talking to a friend at police headquarters over the telephone the records there showed that the license for the particular cab he had followed had been issued to one william johns he was usually to be found around the cab stand in madison square and lived in charlton street End of chapter five chapter six the mysterious woman mr burns busy heels fairly spurned the pavement of fifth avenue as he started toward madison square here was a long line of cabs drawn up beside the curb some twenty or thirty in all the fifth from the end bore the number he sought mr burns chuckled and there alongside it stood william johns swapping billingsgate with the driver of a hansom the while he kept one eye open for a prospective fare it was too easy mr burns paused long enough to congratulate himself upon his marvellous acumen and then he approached the driver are you william johns he accused him sharply that's me cap the cabby answered readily a few minutes past four o'clock this afternoon you went up fifth avenue and stopped at the corner of thirty-fourth street to pick up a fare a young man yep you drove him to the corner of sixty-seventh street and fifth avenue the detective went on just to forestall possible denials he got out there paid you and you went on up fifth avenue far be it from me to deceive you cap responded the cabby with irritating levity i done that same who was that man demanded mr burns coldly search me i never seen him before the detective regarded the cabby with accusing eyes then quite casually he flipped open his coat and johns caught a glimpse of a silver shield it might only have been an accident of course still now johns who was the man in the cab when you stopped to pick up the second man at thirty-fourth street wrong cap and the cabby grinned there wasn't any man don't attempt to deny no man cap it was a woman a woman repeated the detective a woman sure thing a woman a regular woman and cap she was a pippin a peacherino a beauty bright he added gratuitously mr burns stared thoughtfully across the street for a little while so there was a woman in it mr wynne had transferred the contents of the gripsack to her in a cab on a crowded thoroughfare right under his nose i was a little farther down in the line there johns went on to explain about a quarter of four o'clock i guess she came along she got in after telling me to drive slowly up fifth avenue so i would pass the thirty-fourth street five minutes or so after four o'clock 
If a young man with a gripsack hailed me at the corner, I was to stop and let him get in. Then I was to go on up Fifth Avenue. If I wasn't stopped, I was to drive on to 35th Street, cut across to Madison Avenue, down to 33rd Street, and then back to Fifth Avenue, and past 34th Street again, going uptown. The guy with the gripsack caught us first crack out of the box. And then, demanded the detective eagerly, I went on up Fifth Avenue according to sailing orders, and the guy inside stopped me at 67th Street. He got out and gave me a five-spot, tell me to go a few blocks, then turn, and bring the lady back to 6th Avenue L at 58th Street. I done it. That's all. She went up the steps, and that's the last I seen of her. Did she carry a small gripsack? Yup. It would hold about as much as a high hat. Explicit as the information was, it led nowhere, apparently. Mr. Burns readily understood this much. Yet there was a chance, a bare chance, that he might trace the girl on the L, in which case, anyway, it was worth trying. "'What did she look like? How was she dressed?' he asked. "'She had on one of them blue tailor-made things, with a lid to match, and a long feather in it,' the cabbie answered obligingly. "'She was pretty as a—as a—she was a beaut cap, sort of skinny, and had all sorts of hair on her head, brownish-goldish sort of hair. She was about twenty-two, twenty-three, maybe, and—and and cap— she was the goods, that's all. In the course of a day, a thousand women, more or less, answered that description in a general sort of way, riding back and forth on the elevated trains. Mr. Burns sighed as he remembered this. Still, it might produce results. Then came another idea. Did you happen to look in the cab after the young woman left it? he inquired. No. Had any fares since? No. Mr. Burns opened the door of the closed cab and glanced in. Perhaps there might be a stray glove, a handkerchief, some more definite clue than this vague description. He scrutinized the inside of the vehicle carefully. There was nothing. Yes, by jingo, here was something, a white streak under the edge of the cushion on the seat. Mr. Burns' hopeful fingers fished it out. It was a white envelope, sealed, and— And addressed to him. If you are as clever as I imagine you are, you will find this. My address is number blank, East 37th Street. I shall be pleased to see you if you will call. E. Van Cortland Wynne. It was most disconcerting, really. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 A Winged Messenger a snow-white pigeon dropped down out of an azure sky and settled on the topmost girder of the great Singer building. For a time it rested there, with folded pinions, in a din of clanging hammers, and a workman far out on a delicately balanced beam of steel paused in his labors to regard the bird with friendly eyes. The pigeon returned his gaze unafraid. "'Well, old chap,' If I had as little trouble getting up here and down again as you do, I wouldn't mind the job, the workman remarked cheerfully. The pigeon cooed in answer. The steel worker extended a caressing hand, whereupon the bird rose swiftly, surely with white wings widely stretched, circled once over the vast steel structure, then darted away to the north. The workman watched the snow-white speck until it was lost against the blue sky then returned to his labors. Some ten minutes later, Mr. E. Van Cortland Wynne, sitting at his desk in his 37th Street house, was aroused from his meditations by the gentle tinkle of a bell. He glanced up, arose, and went the three flights of stairs to the roof. Half a dozen birds rose and fluttered around him as he opened the trap. One door in their coat at the rear of the building was closed. Mr. Wynne opened this door, reached in and detached a strip of tissue paper from the leg of a snow-white pigeon. He unfolded it eagerly. On it was written, Safe. I love you. D. End 
of chapter seven chapter eight some conjectures mr gustav schultz dropped in to see mr latham after luncheon and listened with puckered brows to a recital of the substance of the detective's preliminary report made that afternoon before mr burns left here rather abruptly mr latham explained in conclusion saying he would see me again either last night or to-day he has not appeared yet and it may be that when he comes he will be able to add materially to what we know now the huge german sat for a time with vacant eyes the great question latham he observed at last gravely is where does win get them i know that i know it said mr latham impatiently that is the very question we are trying to solve and if we don't solve it latham we'll have to do whatever he says mr schultz continued slowly and we may have to do whatever he says anyhow put one hundred million dollars into diamonds in one year just the five of us demanded the other it's preposterous it is preposterous the german agreed readily but there is no argument he was silent for a little while where does he get them where does he get them he repeated thoughtfully do you believe latham it would be possible to smuggle in twenty thirty a hundred million dollars of diamonds certainly not was the reply then if they were not smuggled in they are somehow on the records of the custom house aren't they mr latham snapped his fingers with a sudden realization of this possibility schultz i believe that is our clue he exclaimed keenly certainly they would have been listed by the customs department and come to think of it the tariff on them would have been enormous so enormous that that and he lost the hopeful tone so enormous that we must have heard of it when it became a matter of public record ya yeah, mr schultz agreed diamonds like those duplicates of the coronor the orloff and the regent could never have passed through a custom house latham without attracting attention so mr latham acquiesced by a nod of his head mr schultz sat regarding him through half-closed eyelids and if they are not on the custom records he continued slowly and they are not smuggled in then latham mine got man don't you see see what then they are produced in this country for a minute or two mr latham sat perfectly still gazing into the other's eyes first he was startled then this gave way to incredulity and at last he shook his head no he said flatly no latham the americans produce anything the german went on patiently in eighteen hundred and forty eight we didn't know california was full of gold and so late as eighteen hundred and ninety four we didn't know the klondike was full of gold the greatest diamond fields we know now are in africa but in eighteen hundred and sixty six we didn't know it there is no reason we should not produce diamonds but look here schultz mr latham expostulated it's it's unheard of so was the mississippi river until it was discovered the german argued complacently you are a diamond dealer latham but you don't know much about them where they come from is zenki here send for him he knows more about diamonds than any man that ever lived mr latham sent an office boy for zenki who a few minutes later appeared with an inquiry in his beady black eyes and a nod of recognition for mr schultz sit down mr zenki the german invited sit down and draw a long breath and then tell latham here something about diamonds what is it please mr zenki asked of mr latham mr zenki have you any very definite idea as to where those diamonds came from asked mr latham no was the unhesitating response is it possible that they might have been found in the in the united states mr latham went on certainly they might have been found anywhere 
As a matter of fact, were any diamonds ever found in the United States? Yes, frequently. One very large diamond was found in 1855 at Manchester, across the James River from Richmond, Virginia. It weighed 24 carats when cut, and is the largest, I believe, ever found in this country. Mr. Latham seemed surprised. Why, you astonish me, he remarked. Wait a minute, and he'll astonish you some more, Mr. Schultz put in confidently. Where else in the United States have diamonds been found, Zenke? In California, in North Carolina, and in Hall County, Georgia, replied the expert readily. There is a good ground for the belief that the stone found at Richmond had been washed down from the mountains, farther in the interior, and if that is true, there is a substantial basis for the scientific hypothesis that diamond fields lie somewhere in the Appalachian Range, because the diamonds found in both North Carolina and Georgia were adjacent to those mountains. He paused a moment. This is all a matter of record. His employer was leaning forward in his chair, gripping the arms fiercely as he stared at him. "'Do you believe it possible, Mr. Zenke, he asked deliberately, "'that Mr. Wynne has found these diamond fields?' The expert shrugged his slender shoulders. "'It is possible, of course,' he replied. "'From time to time great sums of money have been spent in searching for them, "'so,' he waved his hand and was silent. "'So you see, Latham,' Mr. Schultz interpolated, "'we don't know anything much. "'We know the African fields.' and the Australian fields, and the Brazilian fields, and the fields in India, but we don't know if new fields have been found. By the time you have lived so long as me, you won't know any more as I do. There was silence for a long time. Mr. Zenke sat with impassive face, and his hands at rest on the arms of the chair. At last he spoke. If you'll pardon me, Mr. Latham, may I suggest another possibility? "'That is?' demanded Mr. Schultz quickly. "'Did you ever hear of the French scientist Charles Friedel?' Mr. Zenke asked, addressing Mr. Latham. "'Never, no. Well, this idea has occurred to me. Some years ago he discovered two or three small diamonds in a meteor. We may safely assume, from the fact that there were diamonds in one meteor, that there may be diamonds in other meteors, therefore—' The German importer anticipated his line of thought, and arose with a guttural burst of Teutonic expletives. Therefore, the expert went on steadily, is it not possible that Mr. Wynne has stumbled upon a huge deposit of diamonds in some meteoric substance some place in this country? A meteor may have fallen anywhere, of course, and it may have been only two months ago, or it may have been two thousand years ago, it may even be buried in his cellar. The huge German nodded his head vigorously with sparkling eyes. It seems extremely probable that if a diamond field has been discovered in the Appalachian Range, Mr. Zenke went on, it would have become public in spite of every effort to prevent it, whereas it is possible that a meteor containing diamonds might have been hidden away easily and also the productions of diamonds from such a source in this country would not make it necessary for the diamonds to pass through the custom-house. Is it clear, sir? Why, it's absurd, fantastic, chimerical, Mr. Latham burst out irritably. It's ridiculous to consider such a thing. I beg your pardon, Mr. Zenke apologized. It is only a conjecture, of course. I may add, that I don't believe that three stones, of the size of the replicas which Mr. Wynne produced here, could have been found anywhere in the world, and brought in here, smuggled in or in the usual way, and the secret held against the thousands of men who daily watch the diamond fields and markets. It would not be difficult, however, if one man alone knew the source of the stones, to keep it from the world at large. I beg your pardon, he added. He arose as if to go. Mr. Schultz brought a heavy hand down on the slim shoulder of the expert, and turned to Mr. Latham. "'Latham, 
"'You are listening to the man who knows more than all of us put in a crowd,' he declared. "'Mein Gott! I do believe he's right!' Mr. Latham was a cold, unimaginative man of business. He hadn't even believed in fairies when he was a boy. This was child talk. He permitted himself to express his opinion by a jerk of his head and was silent. Diamonds like those out of meteors? Bosh! End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 And More Diamonds There was a rap on the door, and a clerk thrust his head in. "'Mr. Burns to see you, sir,' he announced. "'Show him in,' directed Mr. Latham. "'Sit down, both of you, and let's see what he has to say.' There was an odd expression of hope deferred on the detective's face when he entered. He glanced inquiringly at Mr. Schultz and Mr. Zenke, whereupon Mr. Latham introduced them. "'You may talk freely,' he added. "'We are all interested alike.' The detective crossed his legs and balanced his hat carefully on a knee, and the while he favored Mr. Zenke with a sharp scrutiny. There was that in the thin, scarred face and the beady black eyes, which inevitably drew the attention of a stranger, and a half a dozen times as he talked Mr. Burns glanced at the expert. He retold the story of the cab ride up Fifth Avenue, and the car trip back downtown, omitting embarrassing details, such as the finding of two notes addressed to himself, dwelt a moment upon the empty gripsack which Mr. Wynne carried on the car, and then, "'When you told me, Mr. Latham, that the gripsack had contained diamonds when Mr. Wynne left here, I knew instantly how he got rid of them. He transferred them to some person in the cab, in accordance with the carefully prearranged plan.' That person was a woman. A woman, Mr. Latham repeated, as if startled. There is always women in it, remarked Mr. Schultz philosophically. Go on. Mr. Burns was not at all backward about detailing the persistence and skill it had required on his part to establish this fact, and he went on at length to acquaint them with the search that had been made by a dozen of his men to find a trace of the woman from the time she climbed the elevated stairs at 58th Street. He admitted that the quest for her had thus been fruitless, assuring them at the same time that it would go steadily on, for the present at least. And now, Mr. Latham, he went on, and inadvertently he glanced at Mr. Zenke, I have been hampered, of course, by the fact that you have not taken me completely into your confidence in this matter. I mean, he added hastily, that beyond a mere hint of their value, I know nothing whatever about the diamonds which Mr. Wynne had in the gripsack. I gathered, however, that they were worth a large sum of money, perhaps even a million dollars. Ya, yeah, a million dollars at least, remarked Mr. Schultz grimly. Thank you, and the detective smiled shrewdly. Your instructions were to find where he got them? If there had been a theft of a million dollars worth of diamonds anywhere in the world, I would have known it. So I took steps to examine the custom-house records of this and other cities, to see if there had been any unusual shipment to Mr. Wynne, or to anyone else outside of the diamond dealers, thinking this might give me a clue. And what was the result? demanded Mr. Latham quickly. My agents have covered all the Atlantic ports, and they did not come in through the customs house, replied Mr. Burns. I have not heard from the Western agents as yet, but my opinion is, is that they were perhaps smuggled in. Smuggling, after all, is simple, with the thousands of miles of unguarded coasts of this country. I don't know this, of course. I advance it merely as a possibility." Mr. Latham turned to Mr. Schultz and Mr. Zenke with a triumphant smile. Diamonds in meteors? Tommy rot. Of course, the detective resumed, the whole investigation centers about this man Wynne. He has been under the eyes of my agent, as no other man ever was, and in spite of this, has been able to keep in correspondence with his accomplices. And gentlemen, he has done it not through the mails, not over the telephone, 
not by telegraph, and yet he has done it. By wireless, perhaps, suggested Mr. Zenke. It was the first time he had spoken, and the detective took occasion then and there to stare at him frankly. And not by wireless, he said at last. He sends and receives messages from the roof of his house at 37th Street by homing pigeons. Some more fantastics, eh, Mr. Latham? Mr. Schultz taunted. Some more chimericals? I demonstrate this much by the close watch I have kept of Mr. Wynne, the detective went on, there being no response to his questioning look at Mr. Schultz. One of my agents, stationed on the roof of the house adjoining Mr. Wynne's, it was the maid-servant next door, has, on at least one occasion, seen him remove a tissue-paper strip from a carrier pigeon's leg, and read what was written on it, after which he kissed it, gentlemen, kissed it. Then he destroyed it. What did it mean? It means that that particular message was from the girl to whom he transferred the diamonds in the cab, and that he is madly in love with her. Oh, these women! I tell you, commented Mr. Schultz. There was a little pause, then Mr. Burns continued impressively. This correspondence is of no consequence in itself, of course. But it gives us this. Carrier pigeons will only fly home. So if Mr. Wynne received a message by pigeon, it means that at some time within a week, say, he has shipped that pigeon, and perhaps others, from the house in 37th Street, to that person who sent him the message. If he sends messages to that person, it means that he has received a pigeon, or pigeons, from that person within a week. And how were these pigeons shipped? In all probability by express. So, gentlemen, you see there ought to be a record in the express offices which would give us the home town, even the name and address of the person who now has the diamonds in his or her keeping. Is that clear to all of you? "'It's perfectly clear,' commented Mr. Latham, admiringly, while the German nodded his head in approval. "'And that is the clue we are working on at the moment,' the detective added. Three of my men are now searching the records of all the express companies in the city, and there are a great many for the pigeon shipments. If, as seems probable, this clue develops— it may be that we can place our hands on the diamonds within a few days. I don't think I would just place my hands on them, Mr. Schultz advised. They are his diamonds, you know, and your hands might get in trouble. I mean figuratively, of course, the detective amended. He stopped and drummed on his stiff hat with his fingers. Again he glanced at the impassive face of Mr. Zenke with a keen, questioning eye, and for one bare instant it seemed as if he were trying to bring his memory to his aid. "'I've found out all about this man Wynne,' he supplemented after a moment, "'but nothing in his record seems to have any bearing on this case. "'He is an orphan. His mother was a Van Cortland of old Dutch stock, "'and his father was a merchant downtown.' He left a few thousand to his son, and the son is now in business for himself, with an office in Lower Broad Street. He is an importer of brown sugar. "'Brown sugar?' queried Mr. Zenke quickly, and the thin, scarred face reflected for a second some subtle emotion within him. "'Brown sugar?' he repeated. "'Yes,' drawled the detective, with an unpleasant stare. "'Brown sugar.' He imports it from Cuba and Puerto Rico and Brazil, by the shipload, I understand, and makes a good thing of it. A quick pallor overspread Mr. Zenke's countenance, and he arose with his fingers working nervously. His beady eyes were glittering, his lips were pressed together until they were bloodless. "'What's this?' demanded Mr. Schultz curiously. "'My God, gentlemen, don't you see?' the expert burst out violently. Don't you see what this man has done? He has... he has... Suddenly, by a supreme effort, he regained control of himself and resumed his seat. 
"'He has what?' asked Mr. Latham. For half a minute Zenke stared at his employer, then his face grew impassive again. "'I beg your pardon,' he said quietly. "'Mr. Wynne is a heavy importer of sugar from Brazil. "'Isn't it possible that those are Brazilian diamonds? "'That new workings have been discovered somewhere in the interior? "'That he has smuggled them in, concealed in sugar bags, right into New York, "'under the noses of the custom officials? "'I beg your pardon.' he concluded. Late in the afternoon of the following day, a drunken man, unshaven, unkept, unclean, and clothed in rags, lurched into a small pawn-shop in the lower bowery, and planked down on the dirty counter a handful of inert, colorless pebbles, ranging in size from a pea to a peanut. "'Say, Jew, is dem real diamonds?' he demanded thickly. The man in charge glanced at them and nearly fainted. Ten minutes later, Red Haney, knight of the road, was placed under arrest as a suspicious character. Uncut diamonds, valued roughly at fifty thousand dollars, were found in his possession. "'Where did you get them?' demanded the amazed police. "'Found them. "'Where did you find them?' "'None of your business!' and that was all they were able to get out of him at the moment. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 The Big Game When the police of Mulberry Street find themselves face to face with some problem other than the trivial everyday theft, burglary or murder, as the case may be, they are wont to rise up and run around in a circle. The case of Red Haney and the Diamonds blared to the world at large in the newspapers of sunday morning immediately precipitated a circular parade while haney the objective centre snored along peacefully in a drunken stupor the statement of the case in the public press was altogether negative there had been no report of the theft of fifty thousand dollars worth of uncut diamonds in any city of the united states in fact diamonds as a commodity in crime had not figured in police records for several weeks. Not even an actress had mislaid a priceless necklace. The newspapers were unanimously certain that stones of such value could not rightly belong to a man of Haney's type. Therefore, to whom did they belong? Four men at least of the thousands who read the detailed account of the affair Sunday morning immediately made it a matter of personal interest to themselves. One of these was Mr. Latham, another was Mr. Schultz, and a third was Mr. Burns. The fourth was Mr. E. Van Cortland Wynne. In the seclusion of his home in 37th Street, Mr. Wynne read the story with puckered brows, then re-read it, after which he paced back and forth across his room in troubled thought for an hour or more. An oppressive sense of uneasiness was coming over him, and it was reflected in eyes grown somber. After a time with sudden determination, the young man dropped into a chair at his desk and wrote in duplicate on a narrow strip of tough tissue paper just one line, Are you safe? Is all well? Answer quick. W. Then he mounted to the roof. As he flung open the trap, a man on the top of the house next door darted behind a chimney. Mr. Wynne saw him clearly. It was Frank Claflin, but he seemed to consider the matter of no consequence, for he paid not the slightest attention. Instead, he went straight to a cage behind the pigeon coat, wherein a dozen or more birds were imprisoned, removed one of them, attached a strip of tissue paper to its leg, and allowed it to rise from his outstretched hand. The pigeon darted away at an angle, up, up, until it grew indistinct against the void then swung widely in a semicircle, hovered uncertainly for an instant, and flashed off to the west, straight as an arrow flies. Mr. Wynne watched it thoughtfully until it had disappeared, and Kathleen's interest was so intense that he forgot the necessity of screening himself, the result being that when he turned again toward Mr. Wynne, he found that young man gazing at him. Mr. Wynne even nodded in a friendly sort of way as he attached the second strip of tissue to the leg of another bird. This rose as the other had done, and sped away toward the west. 
"'It may be worth your while to know, Mr. Claflin,' Mr. Wynne remarked easily to the detective on the other house, "'that if you ever put your foot on this roof to intercept any message which may come to me, I shall shoot you.' Then he turned and went down the stairs again, closing and locking the trap in the roof behind him. He should get an answer to those questions in two hours, three hours at the most. If there was no answer within that time, he would dispatch more birds, and then, if no answer came, then, then, Mr. Wynne sat down and carefully perused the newspaper story again. At just about that moment the attention of one John Sutton, another of the watchful Mr. Burns' men, on duty in 37th Street, was attracted to a woman who had turned in from Park Avenue, and was coming rapidly toward him on the opposite side of the street. She was young, with the elasticity of perfect health in her step, and closely veiled. She wore a blue tailor-made gown, with a hat to match, and recalcitrant strands of streaming hair gleamed a golden brown. "'By George!' exclaimed the detective. "'It's her!' by which he meant that the mysterious young woman of the cab, whose description had been drilled into him by Mr. Burns, had at last reappeared. He lounged along the street, watching her with keen interest, fixing her every detail in his mind. She did not hesitate. She glanced neither right nor left, but went straight on to the house, occupied by Mr. Wynne, and rang the bell. A moment later the door was opened, and she disappeared inside. The detective mopped his face with tremulous joy. "'Doris!' exclaimed Wynne, as the veiled girl entered the room where he sat. "'Doris, my dear girl, what are you doing here?' He arose and went toward her. She tore off the heavy veil impatiently, and lifted her moist eyes to his. There was suffering in them, uneasiness, and more than that. "'Have you heard from him out there?' she demanded. "'Not today, no,' he responded. "'Why did you come here?' "'Jean, I can't stand it,' she burst out passionately. "'I'm worried to death. "'I can't hear a word, and, and I'm worried to death.' Mr. Wynne wondered if she, too, had seen the morning papers. He stared at her gravely for an instant, then turned, crumpled up the section of newspaper with its glaring headlines, and dropped it into a waste-basket. "'I'm sorry,' he said gently. "'I telephoned twice yesterday,' she rushed on quickly, pleadingly, "'and once last night, and again this morning. "'There was no, no answer. "'Jean, I couldn't stand it. I had to come. "'It's only that he didn't happen to be within hearing of the telephone bell,' he assured her. "'But her steadfast, accusing eyes read more than that in his face.' and her hands trembled on his arm. "'I'm afraid, Jean, I'm afraid,' she declared desperately. "'Suppose, suppose something has happened.' "'It's absurd,' and he attempted to laugh off her uneasiness. "'Why, nothing could have happened.' "'All those millions of dollars worth of diamonds, Jean,' she reminded him. "'And he is. I shouldn't have left him alone. "'Why, my dear Doris,' and Mr. Wynne gathered the slender, trembling figure in his arms protectively. Not one living soul except you and I knows that they are there. There's no incentive to robbery, my dear. A poor shabby little cottage like that, there's not the slightest danger. There's always danger, Jean, she contradicted. It makes me shudder to think of it. He is so old and so feeble, simple as a child and utterly helpless if anything should happen. Then, when I didn't hear from him after trying so many times over the telephone, I'm afraid, Jean, I'm afraid, she concluded desperately. The long, pent-up tears came, and she buried her face on his shoulder. He stood silent, with narrowed, thoughtful eyes. This and the thing in the newspaper there, and evidently she had not seen that, it was not wise that she should see it just yet. That day I took the horrid things from you in the cab. I was awfully frightened, she continued sobbingly. I felt that everyone I passed knew I had them, and you can't imagine what a relief it was when I took them back out there and left them. 
and now when i think that something may have happened to him she paused then raised her tear-dimmed eyes to his face he is all i have in the world now jean except you already the hateful things have cost the lives of my father and my brother and now if he or you oh my god it would kill me i hate them hate them she was shaken by a paroxysm of sobs mr wynne led her to a chair and she dropped into it wearily with her face in her hands nothing can have happened doris he repeated gently i sent a message out there in duplicate only a few minutes ago in a couple of hours now we shall be getting an answer now don't begin to cry he added helplessly and if you don't get an answer she insisted i shall get an answer he declared positively there was a long pause and when i get that answer doris he resumed again becoming very grave you will see how unwise how dangerous even it was for you to come here this way i know it's hard dear he supplemented apologetically but it was only for the week you know and now i don't see how you can go away from here again go away she repeated wonderingly why shouldn't i go away i was very careful to veil myself when i came no one saw me enter i am sure why can't i go away again mr wynne paced the length of the room twice with a troubled brow you don't understand dear he said quietly as he paused before her from the moment i left mr latham's office last thursday i have been under constant surveillance i'm followed wherever i go to my office to luncheon to the theatre everywhere and day and night day and night there are two men watching this house and two other men watching my office. They tamper with my correspondence, trace my telephone calls, question my servants, quiz my clerks. You don't understand, dear, he said again. But why should they do all this? she asked curiously. Why should they? I had expected it all, of course, he interrupted, and it doesn't disturb me in the least. I planned for months to anticipate every emergency. I know every detective who is watching me by name and by sight, and all my plans have gone perfectly, until now. That is why it was necessary for me to keep away from out there, as it was for you to keep away from here. Why, we could not afford to take chances by an interchange of letters or by telephone calls. When I left you in the cab I knew you would get away safely, because they did not know you were there, in the first place and then it was the beginning of the chase, and I forced them to center their attention on me. But now is different. Come here to the window a minute. He led her across the room unresistingly. On the opposite side of the street, staring at the house, was a man. That man is a private detective, Mr. Wynne informed her. His name is Sutton, and he is only one of thirty or forty whose sole business in life right now is to watch me to keep track of and follow any person who comes here. He saw you enter, and you couldn't escape him going out. There's another on the roof of the house next door. His name is Claflin. These men, or others from the same agency, are here all the time. There are two more at my office downtown. Still others are searching customs records, examining the books of express companies, probing into my private affairs and they're all in the employ of the men with whom I am dealing. Do you understand now? I didn't dream of such a thing, the girl faltered slowly. I knew, of course, that... Jean, I shouldn't have come, if only I could have heard from him. My dear girl, it's a big game we are playing, a hundred million dollar game, and we shall win it, unless... We shall win it in spite of them. Naturally, the diamond dealers don't want to be compelled to put up one hundred million dollars. They reason that if the stones I showed them come from new fields, and the supply is unlimited, as I told them, that the diamond market is on the verge of collapse anyway, and, as they look at it, they are compelled to know where they came from. As a matter of fact, if they did know, or if the public got one inkling of the truth, the diamond market would be wrecked, 
and all the diamond dealers in the world working together couldn't prevent it. If they succeed in doing this thing they feel they must do, they will only bring disaster upon themselves. It would do no good to tell them so. I merely laid my plans and am letting them alone. So you see, my dear, it is a game. A big game. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 The Silent Bell He stood looking at her with earnest thoughtful eyes. Suddenly the woman's soul within her awoke in a surging, inexplicable wave of emotion which almost overcame her. And after it came, something of realization of the great fight he was making for her, for her and her aged, feeble grandfather waiting patiently out there. He loved her, this master among men, and she sighed contentedly. For the moment the maddening anxiety that brought her here was forgotten. There was only the ineffable sweetness of seeing him again. She extended her hands to him impulsively, and he kissed them both. The difficulty of you leaving here, he went on after a little, is that you would be followed, and within two hours these men would know all about you, where you are stopping, how long you have been there. They would know of your daily telephone messages to your grandfather, and then, inevitably, they would appear out there and learn all of the rest of it. It doesn't matter how closely they keep watch of me. My plans are all made. I know I am watched, and I make no mistakes. But you! So I should not have come, she questioned. I'm sorry. I understand your anxiety, of course, he assured her, and he was smiling a little. But the worst never happens, so for the present we will not worry. In an hour or more now, I imagine we shall receive a pigeon gram which will show that all is well, and then I shall have to plan for you to get away somehow. She leaned toward him a little, and again he gathered her in his arms. The red lips were mutely raised, and he kissed her reverently. It's all for you, and it will all be right, he assured her. Jean, dear Jean. He pressed a button on the wall, and a maid appeared. You will have to wait for a couple of hours or so at least, so if you would like to take off your things, he suggested with grave courtesy. I dare say the suite just above is habitable, and the maid is at your service. The girl regarded him pensively for a moment, and then turning ran swiftly up the stairs. The maid started to follow more staidly. Just a moment, said Mr. Wynne crisply, in an undertone. Miss Kellner is not to be allowed to use the telephone under any circumstances. Do you understand? She nodded silently and went up the stairs. An hour passed. From the swivel chair at his desk, Mr. Wynne had twice seen Sutton stroll past on the opposite side of the street, and then Claflin had lounged along. Suddenly he arose and went to the window, throwing back the curtains. Sutton was leaning against an electric pole half a block away. Claflin was half a block off in the other direction, in casual conversation with a policeman. Mr. Wynne looked them over thoughtfully. Curiously enough, he was wondering just how he would fare in a physical contest with either, or both. He turned away from the window at last and glanced at his watch impatiently. One hour and forty minutes. In another half hour the little bell over his desk should ring. That would mean that a pigeon had arrived from from out there, and that the automatic door had closed upon it as it entered the coat. But if it didn't come, if it didn't come, then what? There was only one conclusion to be drawn, and he shuddered a little as he thought of it. There could only remain this single possibility when he considered the sinister things that had happened, the failure of the girl to get an answer by telephone, and the unexpected appearance of Red Haney with the uncut diamonds. It might be necessary for him to go out there, and how could he do it? How, without leaving an open trail behind him? How, without inviting defeat in the fight he was making? His meditations were interrupted by the appearance of Miss Kellner. She had crept down the stairs noiselessly, and stood beside him before he was aware of her presence. Her eyes sought his countenance questioningly, and the deadly pallor of her face frightened him. She crept into his arms and nestled there silently, 
with dry staring eyes. He stroked the golden-brown hair with an utter sense of helplessness. "'Nothing yet,' he said finally, and there was a thin assumption of cheeriness in his tone. "'It may be another hour, but it will come. It will come.' "'But if it doesn't, Jean,' she queried insistently, always her mind went back to that possibility. "'We shall cross no bridges until we reach them,' he replied. There is always a chance that the pigeons might have gone astray, for they have this single disadvantage against the incalculable advantage of offering no clue to anyone as to where they go, and it is impossible to follow them. If nothing comes in half an hour now, I shall send two more. And then, if nothing comes? Then, my dear, then we shall begin to worry. Half an hour passed. The little bell was silent. Claflin and Sutton were still visible from the window. Miss Kellner's eyes were immovably fixed on Mr. Wynne's face, and he repressed his gnawing anxiety with an effort. Finally he wrote again on the tissue slips, three of them this time, and together they climbed to the roof, attached the messages, and watched the birds disappear. Another hour, two hours, two hours and a half passed, Suddenly the girl arose with pallid face and colorless lips. "'I can't stand it, Jean. I can't!' she exclaimed hysterically. "'I must know. The telephone?' "'No,' he commanded harshly, and he too arose. "'No.' "'I will!' she flashed. She darted out of the room and along the hall. He followed her with grim determination in his face. She seized the receiver from the hook and held it to her ear. "'Hello,' called Central. "'Give me long distance, Coaldale, number—' "'No!' commanded Mr. Wynne, and he placed one hand over the transmitter tightly. "'Doris, you must not.' "'I will,' she flamed. "'Let me alone.' "'You'll ruin everything,' he pleaded earnestly. "'Don't you know that they get every number I call? "'Don't you know that within fifteen minutes they will have that number, "'and their men will start for there?' She faced him with blazing eyes. "'I don't care,' she said deliberately, and the white face was relieved by an angry flush. "'I will know what has happened out there. I must, Jean. Don't you see that I'm frantic with anxiety? The money means nothing to me. I want to know if he is safe.' His hand was still gripped over the transmitter. Suddenly she turned and tugged at it fiercely. Her sharp little nails bit into the flesh of his fingers. In a last desperate effort she placed the receiver to her lips. "'Give me long distance. Coldale number—' With a quick movement he snapped the connection wire from the instrument, and the receiver was free in her hand. "'Doris, you are mad,' he protested. "'Wait a minute, my dear girl. Just a minute.' "'I don't care. I will know.' Mr. Wynne turned and picked up a heavy cane from the hall stand and brought it down on the transmitter with all his strength. The delicate mechanism jangled and tingled, then the front fell off at their feet. The diaphragm dropped and rolled away. "'Doris, you must not!' he commanded again gravely. "'We will find another way, dear.' "'How dare you!' she demanded violently. "'It was cowardly!' "'Don't you understand?' "'I understand it all,' she broke in. "'I understand that this might lead to the failure of the thing you are trying to do, but I don't care. I understand that already I have lost my father and my brother in this, that my grandmother and my mother were nearly starved to death while it was all being planned, all for these hideous diamonds. Diamonds, diamonds, diamonds. I've heard nothing all my life but that.' As a child it was dinned into me, and now I am sick and weary of it all. I know, I know, something has happened to him now. I hate them, I hate them. She stopped, glared at him with scornful eyes for an instant, then ran up the stairs again. Mr. Wynne touched a button in the wall, and the maid appeared. Go lock the back door, and bring me the key, he commanded. The maid went away, and a moment later returned to hand him the key. He still stood in the hall, waiting. After a little there came a rush of skirts, and Miss Kellner ran down the steps, dressed for the street. 
Doris, he pleaded, you must not go out now. Wait just a moment. We'll find a way, and then I'll go with you. She tried to pass him, but his outstretched arms made her a prisoner. Do I understand that you refuse to let me go? she asked tensely. Not like this, he replied. If you'll give me just a little while, then perhaps, perhaps I may go with you. Even if something had happened there, you could do nothing alone. I, too, am afraid now. Just half an hour. Fifteen minutes. Perhaps I may be able to find a plan. Suddenly she sank down on the stairs with her face in her hands. He caressed her hair tenderly, then raised her to her feet. Suppose you step into the back parlor here, he requested. Just give me fifteen minutes. Then, unless I can find a way for us to go together safely, we will throw everything aside and go anyway. Forgive me, dear. She submitted quietly to be led along the hall. He opened the door into a room and stood aside for her to pass. Jean, Jean, she exclaimed. Her soft arms found their way around his neck, and she drew his face down and kissed him then without a word. She entered the room and closed the door. A minute passed, two, four, five, and Mr. Wynne stood as she left him. Then he opened the front door and stepped out. Frank Claflin was just starting toward the house from the corner, with a deliberate pace, when he glanced up and saw Mr. Wynne signaling for him to approach. Could it be possible? He had had no orders about talking to this man, but perhaps he was going to give it up and with this idea he accelerated his pace and crossed the street. "'Oh, Mr. Claflin, will you step in just a moment, please?' requested Mr. Wynne courteously. "'Why?' demanded the detective suspiciously. "'There's a matter I want to discuss with you,' responded Mr. Wynne. "'It may be that we can reach some sort of... of an agreement about this, and if you don't mind.' Claflin went up the steps. Mr. Wynne ushered him in, and closed the door behind him. Three minutes later Mr. Wynne appeared on the steps, and beckoned to Sutton, who had just witnessed the incident just preceding, and was positively being eaten by curiosity. "'This is Mr. Sutton, isn't it?' inquired Mr. Wynne. "'Yes, that's me. While well, Mr. Claflin and I are discussing this matter, and my proposition to him was such that he felt it must be made in your presence.' Would you mind stepping inside for a moment? You and the girl decided to give it up? queried Mr. Sutton triumphantly. We are just discussing the matter now, was the answer. Sutton went up the steps and disappeared inside. About four minutes after that, Mr. Wynne stood in the hallway, puffing a little as he readjusted his necktie. He picked up his hat, drew on his gloves, and then rapped on the door of the back parlor. Miss Kellner appeared. "'We will go now,' said Mr. Wynne quietly. "'But is it safe, Jean?' she asked quickly. "'Perfectly safe, yes. "'There's no danger of being followed if we go immediately.' "'She gazed at him wonderingly, then followed him to the door. "'He opened it, and she passed out, glancing around curiously. "'For one instant he paused, "'and there came a clatter and clamor from somewhere in the rear of the house. "'He closed the door with a grim smile.' "'Which are the detectives?' asked Miss Kellner, in an awed whisper. "'I don't see them around just now,' he replied. "'We can get a cab at the corner.'" End of Chapter 11 Chapter 12 The Third Degree Some years ago a famous head of the police department clearly demonstrated the superiority of a knockout blow, frequently administered, as against moral suasion, and from that moment the third degree became an institution. Whatever sort of criticism may be made of the third degree, it is nevertheless amazingly effective, and beyond that affords infinite satisfaction to the administrator. There is a certain vicious delight in brutally smashing a sullen, helpless prisoner in the face, and the third degree is not officially in existence. Red Haney was submitted to the third degree, his argument that he found the diamonds, and that having found them they were his until the proper owner appeared, was futile. Ten minutes after having passed into a room, 
where sat Chief Arkwright of the Mulberry Street Force, and three of his men, and Mr. Burns of the Burns Detective Agency, Haney remembered that he hadn't found the diamonds at all. Somebody had given them to him. "'Who gave them to you?' demanded the chief. "'I don't know the guy's name, boss,' Haney replied humbly. "'This is to remind you of it.' Haney found himself sprawled on the floor and looking up with a pleading, piteous expression. His eyes were still red and bleary, his mottled face shot with purple, and the fumes of the liquor still clouded his brain. The chief stood above him with a clenched fist. "'On the level, boss, I don't know,' he whined. "'Get up,' commanded the chief. Haney struggled to his feet and dropped into his chair. "'What's he look like, this man who gave them to you?' Where did you meet him? Why did he give them to you? Now, boss, I'm going to give you the straight goods, Haney pleaded. Don't hit me any more, and I'll tell you all I know about it. The chief sat down again with scowling face. Haney drew a long breath of relief. He's a little skinny feller, boss, the prisoner went on to explain, the while he thoughtfully caressed his jaw. I meets him out here in a little town called Willow Creek, me haven't swung off the freight there to get something to eat. Just got a couple of handouts, and he passes one to me, and we gets to talkin'. He gets to tellin' me something about a nutty old gazebo who lives in the next town, which he had just left. This old bazoo, he says he has a hat full of diamonds up there, but they ain't polished or nothin', and he's there by hisself, and is old and simple, and it's findin' money, he says, to go over and take em away from him. He reckoned there must be a thousand dollars worth altogether. Well, he puts the proposition to me, Haney continues, circumstantially, and I falls for it. We're to go over, and I'm to pipe it all off, to see it's all right. Then I'm to sort of hang around and keep watch, while he goes in and gives the old nut a gentle tap on the cocoa, and cops the sparks. That's what we done. I goes up and takes a few looks round, then I whistles, and he appears from the back, and goes up to the kitchen for a handout. The old guy opens the door, and he goes in. About a minute later he comes out, and gives me a handful of little rocks, them I had, and we go away. He catches a freight going west, and I swings one for Jersey City. When was this? demanded Chief Arkwright. What's today? Haney asked in turn. This is Sunday morning. Well, it was yesterday morning sometime, Saturday. When I gets to Jersey, I take one of the little rocks and goes into a place, shows it to the barkeep. He gives me a lot of booze for it, and I guess I gets considerable lit up, and he also gives me some money to pay ferry fare, and the next thing I knows, I'm nabbed over in the hawk shop. I guess I was lit up good, cause if I'd a been right, I wouldn't a went to a hawk shop and got pinched. He glanced around at the five other men in the room, and he read belief in each face, whereupon he drew a breath of relief. "'What town was it?' asked the chief. "'Little place named Coaldale.' "'Coaldale,' the chief repeated thoughtfully. "'Where is that?' "'About forty or fifty miles out in Jersey,' says Haney. "'I know the place,' remarked Mr. Burns. "'Are you sure, Haney?' said the chief after a pause." "'You are sure you don't know the other man's name?' "'I don't know it, boss.' "'Who was the man you robbed?' "'I don't know.' The chief arose quickly, and the prisoner cringed in his seat. "'I don't know,' he went on protestingly. "'Don't hit me again.' But the chief had no such intention. It was merely to walk back and forth across the room. "'What kind of a man was he? A tramp?' Haney faltered and thoughtfully pulled his under lip. The cunning brain behind the bleary eyes was working now. "'I wouldn't call him a tramp,' he said evasively. "'He had on collar and cuffs and good clothes and talked sort of easy. "'Little skinny man, you said? What color was his hair?' The chief turned in his tracks and regarded Haney with keen, inquiring eyes. The prisoner withstood the scrutiny bravely. "'Sort of blackish?' brownish hair? Black, you mean? Well, yes, black. And his eyes? Black eyes, little and round like gimlet holes. 
Heavy eyebrows, I suppose? Yes, Haney agreed readily. They sort of stuck out. And his nose? Big or little? Heavy or thin? Haney considered that thoughtfully for a moment before he answered, then, Sort of medium nose, boss, with a point on it. And a thin face, naturally. How much did he weigh? Oh, he was a little feller, skinny, you know. I reckon he didn't weigh more than a hundred, twenty-five, or thirty. Some germ had been born in the fertile mind of Mr. Burns. Now it burst into maturity. He leaned forward in his chair and stared coldly at Haney. Perhaps, he suggested slowly, perhaps he had a scar on his face? Haney returned the gaze dully for an instant. Then suddenly he nodded his head. Yes, a scar, he said. From here, Mr. Burns placed one finger on the point of his chin and drew it across his right jaw. Yes, a scar, that's it, the prisoner acquiesced, from his chin almost around to his ear. Mr. Burns came to his feet while the official police stared. The chief sat down again and crossed his fat legs. Why, what do you know, Burns? he queried. I know the man, chief, the detective burst out confidently. I'd gamble my head on it. I knew it. I knew it, he told himself. Again he faced the tramp. Haney, do you know how much the diamonds you had were worth? Must have been three or four hundred dollars. Something like fifty thousand dollars, Mr. Burns informed him impressively. And if you got fifty thousand dollars for your share, the other man got a million. Haney only stared. End of chapter twelve. Chapter thirteen. Mr. Zenke appears. Half an hour later, Mr. Burns, Chief Arkwright, and Detective Sergeant Connolly were on a train, bound for Coaldale. Mr. Burns had left them for a moment at the ferry and rushed into a telephone booth. When he came out, he was exuberantly triumphant. "'It's my man, all right,' he assured the chief. "'He has been missing since Friday night, and no one knows his whereabouts. "'It's my man.' It was an hour's ride to Coaldale, a sprawling, scraggly village, with only four or five houses in sight from the station. When the three men left the train there, Mr. Burns walked over and spoke to the agent, a thin, cadaverous, tobacco-chewing specimen of his species. "'We are looking for an old gentleman who lives out here somewhere,' he explained. "'He probably lives alone, and we've been told that he has a little cottage somewhere over this way.' He waved his hand vaguely to the right, in accordance with the directions of Red Haney. The station agent scratched his stubbly chin and spat with great accuracy through a knot-hole ten feet away. "'Spect you mean old man Kellner,' he replied obligingly. "'He lives by himself part of the time. "'Then again, sometimes his granddaughter lives with him.' "'Granddaughter?' Mr. Burns almost jumped. "'A granddaughter, yes,' he said with a forced calm. "'Rather a pretty girl, twenty-two or three years old. "'Sometimes she dresses in blue.' "'Yes,' the agent agrees. "'Spect them's them.' Follow the road down till you come to the widow gardener's hog lot, then turn to your left, and it's about a quarter of a mile on. The only house up that way. You can't miss it. The agent stood squinting at them, with friendly inquiry radiating from his parchment like countenance, and Mr. Burns took an opportunity to ask some other questions. By the way, what sort of a man is this Kellner? What does he do? Is he wealthy? A pleasant grin overspread the informant's face. One finger was raised to his head and twirled significantly. Spect he's crazy, he went on to explain. Don't do nothing so far as anybody knows. Lives like a hermit, stays in the house all the time, and has long whiskers. Don't know whether he's rich or not, but spect he ain't, cause no man with money lives like he does. He thrust a long forefinger into Mr. Burns' face. "'And stingy? He's so stingy he won't let nobody come in the house, "'scared they'll wear the furniture out looking at it. "'How long has he lived here? "'There ain't nobody in this town old enough to say. "'Why, mister, I'll bet that old man's a thousand years old. 
Wait till you see em. That was all. They went on as indicated. The very type of man who would scrimp and starve to put all his money in something like diamonds, mused Chief Arkwright. The usual rich old miser who winds up being murdered. They passed the widow gardener's hog lot and came into a pleasant country road, which, turning, brought them to a shabby little cottage embowered in trees. Through the foliage, far on, they caught the amber gleam of a languid river, and around their feet, as they entered the yard, scores of pigeons fluttered. Carriers! ejaculated Mr. Burns, as if startled. With a strange feeling of elation, the detective led the way up the steps to the veranda and knocked. There was no answer. He glanced at the chief significantly and tried the door. It was locked. "'Try the back door,' directed Chief Arkwright tersely. "'If that's locked, we'll go in anyway.' They passed around the house to the rear, and Mr. Burns laid one hand upon the doorknob. He turned it, and the door swung inward. Again he glanced at Chief Arkwright. The chief nodded and led the way into the house. They stood in a kitchen, clean as to floors and table, but now in the utmost disorder. They spent only a moment here, then passed into the narrow hall, along this to a door that stood open, and then... Then Chief Arkwright paused, staring downward, and respectfully lifted his hat. "'Always the same,' he remarked enigmatically. Mr. Burns thrust himself forward and through the door. On the floor, with white face turned upward, and fixed, staring eyes, lay an old man. His venerable gray hair, long and unkept, fell back from a brow of noble proportions, the wide high brow of the student, and a great snow-white beard rippled down over his breast. Save for the glassiness of the eyes, the face was placid in death, even as it must have been in life. Mutely Mr. Burns examined the body. A blow in the back of the head, that was all. Then he glanced around the room inquiringly. Everything was in order, except except here lay an overturned cigar-box. He picked it up. Two uncut diamonds were on the floor beneath it. The rough, inert pebbles silently attested to the obvious manner of death, which simultaneously forced itself upon the three men. The cowardly blow of an assassin, a dying struggle, perhaps, for the contents of the box. And this, the end. From outside came sharply in the silence the rattle of wheels on the gravel of the road, and a vehicle stopped in front of the door. Shh! warned the chief. Someone came along the walk, up the steps, and rapped briskly on the door. The detectives waited, motionless. Silent, the knob rattled under impatient fingers, then the footsteps passed along the veranda quickly and were lost, as if someone had stepped off at the end, intending to come to the back door, which was open. A moment later they heard steps in the kitchen, then in the narrow hall approaching, and the doorway of the room where they stood framed the figure of a man. It was Mr. Zenke. "'There's your man, Chief,' remarked Mr. Burns quietly. The diamond expert permitted his gaze to wander from one to the other of the three men, and then the beady black eyes came to rest on the silent, outstretched figure of the old man. He started forward impulsively. The grip of Detective Sergeant Connolly on his arm stopped him. "'You're my prisoner!' "'Yes, I understand,' said Mr. Zenke impatiently. He didn't even look up. He was still gazing at the figure on the floor." "'Well, what have you got to say for yourself?' demanded Chief Arkwright coldly. Mr. Zenke met the accusing stare of the chief squarely for an instant. Then the keen eyes shifted to the slightly flushed face of Mr. Burns, and lingered there interrogatively. "'I have nothing whatsoever to say,' he replied at last, and he drew one hand slowly across the thin, scarred face." "'Yes, I understand,' he repeated absently. 
I have nothing to say. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 Caught in the Net Doris looked down in great dry-eyed horror upon the body of this withered old man whom she had loved, and the thin thread of life within her all but snapped. It has come, the premonition of disaster has been fulfilled. The last of her blood had been sacrificed to the mercilessly glittering diamonds, father, brother, and now him. Mr. Wynne's face went white and his teeth closed fiercely. He had loved this old man, too. Then the shock passed, and he returned anxiously to Doris to receive the limp, inert figure in his arms. She had fainted. "'Well, what do you know about it?' inquired Chief Arkwright abruptly. Mr. Wynne was himself again instantly, the calm, self-certain, perfectly poised young man of affairs. He glanced at the chief, then shot a quick, inquiring look at Mr. Zenke. Almost imperceptibly, the diamond expert shook his head. Then Mr. Wynne's eyes turned upon Mr. Burns. There had been triumph in the detective's face until that moment. But, under the steady, meaning glare, which was directed at him, triumph faded to a sort of wonder, followed by a vague sense of uneasiness, and he read a command in the fixed eyes, a command to silence. Curiously enough, it reminded him that he was in the employ of Mr. Latham, and that there were certain business secrets to be protected. He regarded the coroner's physician, hastily summoned for a perfunctory examination. Well, demanded the chief again. Nothing of this, replied Mr. Wynne. I think, doctor, and he addressed the physician, that she needs you more than he does. We know only too well what's the matter with him. The physician arose obediently. Mr. Wynne gathered up the slender still figure in his arms, and bore it away to another room. The doctor bent over Doris and tested the fluttering heart. Only shock, he said finally, when he looked up. She'll come round all right in a little while. Thank God, the young man breathed softly. He stooped and pressed reverent lips to the marble-white brow, then straightening up, and after one long, lingering look at her, turned quickly and left the room. I have no statement to make, Mr. Zenke was saying, in that level, unemotional way of his, when Mr. Wynne re-entered the room where lay the dead. "'We are to assume that you are guilty, then,' demanded Chief Arkwright, with cold finality. "'I have nothing to say,' replied the expert. His gaze met that of Mr. Wynne for a moment, then settled on the venerable face of the old man. "'Guilty?' interposed Mr. Wynne quickly. "'Guilty of what?' Chief Arkwright, without speaking, waved his hand toward the body on the floor. There was a flash of amazement in the young man's face, a sudden bewilderment. The diamond expert's countenance was expressionless. "'You don't deny that you killed him,' persisted the chief accusingly. "'I have nothing to say,' said the expert again. "'And you don't deny that you were Red Haney's accomplice?' "'I have nothing to say,' was the monotonous answer. The chief shrugged his shoulders impatiently. Some illuminating thought shone for an instant in Mr. Wynne's clear eyes, and he nodded as if a question in his mind had been answered. "'Perhaps, Chief, there may be some mistake,' he protested half-heartedly. "'Perhaps this gentleman... what motive would...' "'There's motive enough,' interrupted the chief briskly. "'We have this man's description straight from his accomplice, Red Haney, even to the scar on his face.' He paused abruptly, and regarded Mr. Wynne through half-closed lids. "'By the way,' he continued deliberately, "'who are you? What do you know about it?' "'My name is Wynne, E. Van Cortland Wynne,' was the ready response. "'I am directly interested in this case, through a long-standing friendship for Mr. Kellner here, and through the additional fact that his granddaughter in the adjoining room is soon to become my wife.' there was a little pause. I may add that I live in New York, and that Miss Kellner has been stopping there for several days. 
She has been accustomed to hearing from her grandfather at least once a day by telephone, but she was unable to get an answer either yesterday or today, so she came to my home, and together we came out here. Mr. Burns looked up quickly. It had suddenly occurred to him to wonder as to the whereabouts of Claflin and Sutton, who had been on watch at the 37th Street house. The young man interpreted the expression of his face all right, and favored him with a meaning glance. "'We came alone,' he supplemented. Mr. Burns silently pondered it. "'All that being true,' Chief Arkwright suggested tentatively, "'perhaps you can give us some information as to the diamonds that were stolen. "'How much were they worth? How many were there?' He held up the uncut stones that had been found on the floor. "'I don't know their exact number,' was the reply. "'Their value, I should say, was about sixty thousand dollars. "'Except for this little house and the grounds adjoining, "'practically all of Mr. Kellner's money was invested in diamonds. "'Those you have there are part of an accumulation of many years, "'imported in the rough, one or two at a time.' Mr. Zenke was gazing abstractedly out of a window, but the expression on his lean face indicated the keenest interest. And, and something else, apprehension maybe. The chief stared straight into the young man's eyes for an instant, and then, and Mr. Kellner's family, he inquired. There is no one except his granddaughter Doris. Some change, sudden as it was pronounced, came over the chief, and, his whole attitude altered. He dropped into a chair near the door. "'Have a seat, Mr. Wynne,' he invited courteously, "'and let's understand this thing clearly. "'Over there, please,' and he indicated a chair partly facing that in which Mr. Zenke sat. Mr. Wynne sat down. "'Now you don't seem to believe,' the chief went on pleasantly, "'that Zenke here killed Mr. Kellner?' "'Well, no,' the young man admitted." Mr. Zenke glanced at him quickly, warningly. The chief was not looking, but he knew the glance had passed. "'And why don't you believe it?' he continued. "'In the first place,' Mr. Wynne began without hesitation, "'the diamonds were worth only about sixty thousand dollars, "'and Mr. Zenke here draws a salary of twenty-five thousand dollars a year. "'The proportion is wrong, you see.' Again, Mr. Zenke is a man of unquestioned integrity. As diamond expert of the Henry Latham Company, he handles millions of dollars worth of precious stones each year, and has practically unlimited opportunities for theft, without murder, if he were seeking to steal. He has been with that company for several years, and that fact alone is certainly to his credit. Very good, commented the chief ambiguously. He paused an instant to study this little man with an interest aroused by the sum of his salary. "'And what of Haney's description, his accusation?' he asked. "'Haney might have lied, you know,' retorted Mr. Wynne. "'Men in his position have been known to lie.' "'I understand you say,' the chief resumed, heedless of the note of irony in the other's voice, "'that you and Miss Kellner are to be married?' "'Yes.' and that she is the only heir of her grandfather? Yes. Therefore, at his death, the diamonds would become her property? For one instant, Mr. Wynne seemed startled, and turned his clear eyes full upon his interrogator, seeking the hidden meaning. Yes, but, he began slowly. That's true, isn't it? demanded the chief, with quick violence. Yes, that's true, Mr. Wynne admitted calmly. Therefore, indirectly, it would have been to your advantage if Mr. Kellner had died or had been killed. In that the diamonds would have come to my intended wife, yes, was the reply. Mr. Zenke clasped and unclasped his thin hands nervously. His face was again expressionless, and the beady eyes were fastened immovably on Chief Arkwright's. Mr. Burns was frankly amazed at this unexpected turn of the affair. Suddenly Chief Arkwright brought his hand down on the arm of his chair with a bang. Suppose for the moment that Red Haney lied, and that Mr. Zenke is not the murderer. Then, as a matter of fact, 
"'Your salary isn't twenty-five thousand dollars a year, is it?' He was on his feet now with blazing eyes, and one hand was thrust accusingly into Mr. Wynne's face. It was simulation. Mr. Burns understood it. A police method of exhausting possibilities. There was not the slightest movement by Mr. Wynne to indicate uneasiness at the charge, nor a tremor in his voice when he spoke again. "'I understand perfectly, Chief,' he remarked coldly. "'Just what was the time of the crime, may I ask?' "'Answer my question,' insisted the chief thunderously. "'Now look here, chief,' Mr. Wynne went on frigidly. "'I am not a child to be frightened into making any absurd statements. "'I do not draw a salary of twenty-five thousand a year, no. "'I am in business for myself, and make more than that. "'You may satisfy yourself by examining the books in my office, if you like. "'By intimation, at least, you are accusing me of murder.' Now answer me a question, please. What was the time of the crime? End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 The Truth in Part The chief dropped back into his chair with the utmost complacency. This was not the kind of man with whom mere bluster counted. Haney says Saturday morning, he answered. The coroner's physician agrees with that. "'Yesterday morning,' Mr. Wynne mused. "'Then, after a moment, "'I think, Chief, you know Mr. Burns here, "'and that you would accept a statement of his as correct?' "'Yes,' the Chief agreed with a glance at Mr. Burns. "'Mr. Burns, where was I all day Saturday?' "'Mr. Wynne queried, without so much as looking around at him. "'You were in your house from eleven o'clock Friday night "'until fifteen minutes of nine o'clock Saturday morning.' was the response. You left there at that time and took the surface car at 34th Street to your office. You left your office at five minutes of one, took luncheon alone at the Saverin, and returned to your office at two o'clock. You remained there until five or a few minutes past, then returned home. At eight, you... Is that sufficient? interrupted Mr. Wynne. Does that constitute an alibi? Yes, he admitted, but how do you know all this, Burns? Mr. Burns and the men of his agency have favored me with the almost persistent attentions during the last few days, Mr. Wynne continued promptly. He has had two men constantly on watch at my office day and night, and two others constantly on watch at my home day and night. There are two there now, one in the rear room of the basement, and another in the pantry, with the doors locked on the outside. Their names are Claflin and Sutton. So that was it! It came home to Mr. Burns suddenly. Claflin and Sutton had been tricked into the house on some pretext, and locked in. Confound their stupidity! Why are they locked up? demanded the chief, with kindling interest. Why have you been watched? I think perhaps Mr. Burns will agree with me when I say that that has nothing whatever to do with this crime, replied Mr. Wynne easily. That's for me to decide, declared the chief bluntly. There was a long pause. Mr. Zanke was leaning forward in his chair, gripping the arms fiercely, with his lips pressed into a thin line. It was only by a supreme effort that he held himself in control and the lean, scarred face was working strangely. "'Well, if you insist on knowing,' observed Mr. Wynne, slowly, "'I suppose I'll have to tell all of it. "'In the first place, don't!' "'It came finally, the one word from Mr. Zenke's half-closed lips, "'a smothered explosion which drew every eye upon him.' Mr. Wynne turned slightly in his chair, and regarded the diamond expert, with an expression of astonishment on his face. The beady black eyes were all aglitter with the effort of repression, and some intangible message flashed in them. "'In the first place,' resumed Mr. Wynne, as if there had been no interruption, "'Mr. Kellner here—' "'Don't!' the expert burst out again desperately. "'Don't! It means ruin! Absolute ruin!' Mr. Kellner had those diamonds, about sixty thousand dollars worth of them, 
Mr. Wynne continued distinctly. Mr. Kellner decided to sell some diamonds. One of the quickest and most satisfactory methods of selling rough gems, such as those you have in your hand, Chief, is to offer them directly to the men who deal in them. I went to Mr. Henry Latham and other jewelers of New York on behalf of Mr. Kellner and offered them a quantity of diamonds. It may be that they regarded the quantity I offered as unusual, that I don't know, but I would venture the conjecture that they did. He paused a moment. Mr. Zenke's face, again growing expressionless, was turned toward the light of the window. Chief Arkwright was studying it shrewdly. Diamond merchants, of course, have to be careful, the young man went on smoothly. They can't afford to buy whatever is offered by people whom they don't know. They had reason, too, to believe that I was not acting for myself alone. What was more natural, therefore, than that they should have called in Mr. Burns and the men of his agency to find out about me, and, if possible, to find out whom I represented, so they might locate the supply? I wouldn't tell them, because it was not desirable that they should deal directly with Mr. Kellner, who was old and childish and lacking, perhaps, in appreciation of the real value of diamonds." The result of all this was that the diamond dealers placed me under strict surveillance. My house was watched, my office was watched. My mail going and coming was subjected to scrutiny, my telephone calls were traced, telegrams opened and read. I had anticipated all this, of course, and was in communication with Mr. Kellner here only by carrier pigeons. He glanced meaningly at Mr. Burns, who was utterly absorbed in the recital. Those carrier pigeons were not exchanged by express, because the records would have furnished a clue to Mr. Burns' men. I personally took them back and forth in a suitcase before I approached Mr. Latham with the original proposition. He was giving categorical answers to a few of the multitude of questions to which Mr. Burns had been seeking answers. The tense expression about Mr. Zanke's eyes was dissipated, and he sighed a little. I saw the Red Haney affair in the newspapers this morning, as you will know, he continued after a moment. It was desirable that I should come out here with Miss Kellner, but it was not desirable, even under those circumstances, that I should permit myself to be followed. That's how it happens that Mr. Claflin and Mr. Sutton are now locked up in my house. Again there was a pause. Mr. Burns, I know, will be glad to confirm my statement of the case, in so far as his instructions from Mr. Latham and the other gentlemen interested bear on it. Chief Arkwright glanced at the detective inquiringly. That's right, Mr. Burns admitted with an uncertain nod. That is, so far as my instructions go. I understood, though, that the diamonds were worth more than sixty thousand dollars, in fact, that there might have been a million dollars worth of diamonds. A million dollars? repeated Chief Arkwright in amazement. A million dollars? he repeated. He turned fiercely upon Mr. Wynne. What about that? he demanded. I'm sure I don't know what Mr. Burns understood, replied the young man, with marked emphasis. But it's preposterous on the face of it, isn't it? Would a man with a million dollars' worth of diamonds live in a hovel like this? The chief considered the matter reflectively for a minute or more, the while his keen eyes alternately searched the faces of Mr. Wynne and Mr. Zenke. It would depend on the man, of course, he said at last. Then some new idea was born within him. Your direct connection with the crime seems to be disproved, Mr. Wynne, he remarked slowly. And if we admit his innocence, he jerked a thumb at the expert, there remains yet another viewpoint. Do you see it? The young man turned upon him quickly. Does it occur to you that every argument I advance to furnish you with a motive for the crime might well be applied with equal weight against Miss Kellner? Doris, flamed Mr. Wynne, for the first time his perfect self-possession deserted him, and he came to his feet with gripping hands. Why, why, what are you talking about? Sit down, advised the chief quietly. 
Mr. Zenke glanced at them once uneasily, then resumed his fixed stare out of the window. "'Sit down,' said the chief again. Mr. Wynne glared at him for an instant, then dropped back into his chair. His hands were clenched desperately, and a slight flush in his clean-cut face showed the fight he was making to restrain himself. All the property this old man owned, including the diamonds, would become her property in the event of his death. Or murder, the chief added mercilessly. That's true, isn't it? But when she entered this room her every act testified to her innocence, Mr. Wynne burst out passionately. The chief shrugged his shoulders. She has been living in a little hotel in Irving Place, the young man rushed on. The people there can satisfy you as to her whereabouts on Saturday. Again the chief shrugged his shoulders. And remember, please, that the best answer to all that is that Haney had the diamonds. It doesn't necessarily follow, Mr. Wynne, said the other steadily, that she committed the crime with her own hands. It comes down simply to this. If there were only sixty thousand dollars worth of diamonds, then the one motive which Zenki might have had is eliminated, because Haney had practically fifty thousand dollars worth of them, and here are some others. There would have been no share for your expert here. And again, if there were only sixty thousand dollars worth of the diamonds, you or Miss Kellner would have been the only persons to benefit by his death. But Haney had those, protested Mr. Wynne. Just what I'm saying, agreed the other complacently. Therefore, there were more than sixty thousand dollars worth. However we look at it, whoever may have been Haney's accomplice, that point seems settled. Or else Haney lied, declared Mr. Wynne flatly. If Haney came here alone, killed this old man, and stole the diamonds, there would be none of these questions, would there? Mr. Burns, who had listened silently, arose suddenly and left the room. Mr. Wynne's last suggestion awakened a new train of thought in the police official's mind, and he considered it silently for a moment. Finally he shook his head. The fact remains, he said, as if reassuring himself, that Haney described an accomplice, and that that description fits Zenki perfectly, that Zenki has refused to defend himself or even make a denial, that he has drawn suspicion upon himself by everything he has done and said since he has been here, even by the strange manner of his appearance at this house. Therefore, there were more diamonds, and he got his share of them. Hello, came in Mr. Burns' voice from the hall. Give me 21845 River, New York. Yes. Is Mr. Latham there? Yes, Henry Latham. Again Mr. Wynne's self-possession forsook him, and he came to his feet, evidently with the intention of interrupting that conversation. He started forward with gritting teeth, and simultaneously Chief Arkwright, Detective Sergeant Conley, and Mr. Zenke laid restraining hands upon him. Something in the expert's grip on his wrist caused him to stop and cease a futile struggle. Then came a singular expression of resignation about the mouth, and he sat down again. "'Hello? This Mr. Latham? This is Detective Burns.' I have been able to locate some diamonds, but it's necessary to know something of the quantity of those you mentioned. You remember Mr. Schultz said something about... Yes. Yes. Oh, there were. Unexpected developments? Yes. I'll call and see you tonight about eight. Yes. Goodbye. Mr. Burns re-entered the room, his face aglow with triumph. Mr. Wynne glanced almost hopelessly at Mr. Zenke, then turned again to the detective. "'I should say there were more than sixty thousand dollars worth of them,' Mr. Burns blurted. "'There were at least a million dollars worth.' Mr. Schultz intimated as much to me. Now Mr. Latham confirms it. Chief Arkwright turned and glared scowlingly upon the diamond expert. His beady black eyes were alight with some emotion which he failed to read. 
"'Where are they, Zenki? demanded the chief harshly. "'I have nothing to say,' replied Mr. Zenki softly. "'So your disappearance Friday night, and your absence all day yesterday, "'did have to do with this old man's death?' said the chief, directly accusing him. "'I have nothing to say,' murmured Mr. Zenki. "'That settles it, gentlemen,' declared the chief with an air of finality. "'Zenki, I charge you with the murder of Mr. Kellner here. "'Anything you may say will be used against you. "'Come along now. Don't make any trouble.'" End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 Mr. Zenki Explains Fairly drunk with excitement, his lean face, usually expressionless, now flushed and working strangely, and his beady black eyes aglitter, Mr. Zenke reeled into the study where Mr. Latham and Mr. Schultz sat awaiting Mr. Burns. He raised one hand, enjoining silence, closed the door, locked it, and placed the key in his pocket, after which he turned upon Mr. Latham. "'He makes them, man! He makes them!' he burst out between gritted teeth. "'Don't you understand? He makes them!' Mr. Latham, astonished and a little startled, came to his feet. The phlegmatic German sat still, staring at the expert without comprehension. Mr. Zenke's thin fist was clenched under his employer's nose, and the jeweler drew back a little, vaguely alarmed. "'I don't understand what,' he began. "'The diamonds,' Mr. Zenke interrupted, and the long, pent-up excitement within him burst into a flame of impatience. The diamonds, he makes them, don't you see? The diamonds, he manufactures them. Got in himmel, exclaimed Mr. Schultz, and it was anything but an irreverent ejaculation. He arose. The miracle has come to pass. We must have known, we must have known. Millions and millions of dollars worth of them, even billions for all we know, the expert rushed on in incoherent violence, a sum greater than all the combined wealth of the world in the hands of one man. Think of it! Mr. Latham only gazed at him blankly, and he turned instinctively to the one who understood, Mr. Schultz. Think of the mind that achieved it, man! He collapsed into a chair and sat looking at the floor, his fingers writhing within one another, muttering to himself. Mr. Latham was a cold, sane, unimaginative man of business. As yet the full import of it all hadn't reached him. He stared dumbly, first at Mr. Zenke, then at Mr. Schultz. There was not even incredulity in the look, only faint amazement that two such well-balanced men should have gone mad at once. At last the German importer turned upon him flatly. "'Why don't you get excited about it, Latham?' he demanded. He is all right, not crazy, he added with whimsical assurance. He is telling you that those diamonds are made, made like doughnuts, manufactured, put together. Don't you get it? He ran off into guttural German expletives, and slowly, slowly the idea began to dawn upon Mr. Latham. The diamonds Mr. Wynne had shown were not real then. They were artificial, it was some sort of swindle. Of course! But the experts had agreed that they were diamonds, real diamonds. Perhaps they had been deceived, or... By George! Did these two men mean to say that they were real diamonds, but that they were manufactured? Mr. Latham's tidy little imagination balked at that. Absurd! Who ever heard of a diamond as big as the Coronor, or the Regent, or the Orloff being made. They were crazy, the pair of them. Do I understand, he demanded in a tone of deliberate annoyance, that you, Zenke, and you, Schultz, expect me to believe that those diamonds we saw were not natural, but were real diamonds turned out by machinery in a, in a diamond factory? Is that what you are driving at? That is, declared the German bluntly, it was coming in time, Latham. It was coming, of course. And I have always noticed that whatever is coming, does come. Made. Made as you make marbles? 
Mr. Zenke repeated monotonously. Yes, it had to come, but— but imagine the insuperable difficulties that one brain had to surmount. He passed a thin hand across his flushed brow, and was thoughtfully silent. "'I don't believe it,' asserted Mr. Latham tartly. "'It's impossible. I don't believe it,' and sat down. "'It don't matter much whether you believe it or not,' remarked the German, in a tone of resignation. "'If it is, it is.' and all those diamonds in your place and mine are not worth much more than a bushel of potatoes. Mr. Latham turned away from him, half angrily, and glared at the expert who was still regarding the floor. "'What do you know about this anyway, Zenke? he demanded. "'How do you know he makes them? Have you seen him make them?' Thus directly addressed, Mr. Zenke looked up, and the living flame of wonder within his eyes flickered and died. In silence for a minute or more, he studied the unconcealed skepticism in his employer's face, and then asked slowly, "'Do you know what diamonds are, Mr. Latham?' "'There is some theory that they are pure carbon crystallized.' "'They are that,' declared the expert impatiently. "'Do you know that diamonds have been made?' "'Oh, I read something about it, yes, but what I—' "'Every schoolboy knows how to make a diamond, Mr. Latham. "'If pure carbon is heated to approximately 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit "'and simultaneously subjected to a pressure of approximately 6,000 tons to the square inch, "'it becomes a diamond. "'And there's no theory about that. That's a fact.' The difficulty has always been to apply the knowledge we have in a commercially practicable way, in other words, to isolate a carbon that is absolutely pure, and invent a method of applying the heat and pressure simultaneously. It has been done, Mr. Latham. It has been done. Don't you understand what it means to— With an effort he repressed the returning excitement which found vent in a rising voice— and quick, nervous gestures of the hands. After a moment he went on. Half a score of scientists have made diamonds, minute particles no larger than one point of a pin. Professor Henry Moisson of Paris went further, and by use of an electric furnace produced diamonds as large as a pin head. You may remember that when I first met Mr. Wynne, he inquired if I had not done some special work for Professor Moisson. I had. I tested the diamonds he made. And they were diamonds. I dare say the suggestion Mr. Wynne conveyed to me by that question, that is, the suggestion of manufactured diamonds, had been carefully planned, for he is a wonderful young man, Mr. Wynne, a wonderful young man. He paused a moment. We know that he had millions and millions of dollars' worth of them. We know because we saw them. "'and who can tell how many billions more there are? "'The one man holds in his hand "'the power to overturn the money values of the earth. "'But how do you know he makes them?' "'demanded Mr. Latham, returning to the main question. "'He suggested it by his question,' Mr. Zenke went on. "'That suggestion lingered in my mind. "'When the detective, Mr. Burns, "'reported that Mr. Wynne was an importer of brown sugar,' I was on the point of advancing a theory that the diamonds were manufactured. Because of all known substances, burnt brown sugar is richest in carbon. But you, Mr. Latham, had discredited a previous suggestion of mine, and I, well, I didn't suggest it. Instead, that night, I personally began an investigation to see what disposition was made of the sugar. I found that the ships discharged their cargoes in Hoboken, that the sugar was there loaded on barges, and those barges hauled up a small stream to a little town of Coaldale, all consigned to a Mr. Hugo Kellner. It took Friday, all day Saturday, and a great part of today to learn all this. This afternoon I went to see Kellner. I found him murdered. He stated it merely as an inconvenient incident. In the room with the body were Mr. Burns, Chief Arkwright of the New York Police, and another New York detective. 
I had glanced at the story of Red Haney and the diamonds in the morning paper, and from Mr. Burns's presence, I surmised something of the truth. I was instantly placed under arrest for the murder. The murder of this man I had never seen, the real diamond master, the man who achieved it all. He was silent for a moment, as if from infinite weariness. Mr. Wynne came, and Miss Kellner, granddaughter of the dead man. He saw me, and understood. Between us we contrived that I should be taken away as the murderer, and so to prevent an immediate search of the house. I made no denial. I permitted myself to be taken. Some mistake as to identity. I proved an alibi by the shipping men in Hoboken. The diamonds are there untold millions of dollars' worth of them. The diamond master is dead. Mr. Latham had been listening, as if dazed, to the hurried, somewhat disconnected narrative. Mr. Schultz, keener to comprehend all that the story meant, was silent for a moment. "'Then if all those men know all he told us, Latham,' he remarked finally, "'our diamonds are not worth any more than potatoes already.' "'But they don't know!' Mr. Zenke burst out fiercely. "'Don't you understand? "'Haney, or somebody, killed Mr. Kellner and stole some uncut diamonds. "'You must have seen the newspaper account of it today. "'The New York police traced Haney's course to Coaldale and to that house. "'But all they know is that sixty thousand dollars worth of uncut stones were stolen.' There was not even a suggestion to them of the millions and millions of dollars' worth that were manufactured. Don't you understand? I permitted myself to be accused and arrested, knowing I could establish an alibi, in order to lead them away from there, and gain time at least, to give Mr. Wynne an opportunity of hiding the other diamonds, if they were there. He understood what I was trying to do and fell in with the plan. He knew that I knew the diamonds were made. Mr. Burns doesn't know. No one knows but you and me and Mr. Wynne and perhaps the girl. But don't you see, if you don't accept the proposition he made, the diamond market of the world is ruined. You are ruined. But how do you know they are made? insisted Mr. Latham doggedly. You've never seen them made, have you? Latham. "'Mine got, Latham, how do you know when you have a boil on the back of your neck? "'You can't see it,' Mr. Schultz turned to Mr. Zenke. "'The three of us will go and see Mr. Wynne. "'It is a miracle. It is, and it don't do any good to say it ain't.'" End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 The Great Cube a cube of solid, polished steel, some twenty feet square, set on a spreading base of concrete, and divided perpendicularly down the middle into titanic halves, those being snugly fit one to the other by a series of triangular corrugations, a variation of the familiar tongue and groove. Interlacing the ponderous mass, from corner to corner, were huge steel bolts, and the hulking heads of more bolts, some forty on each of the four sides, showed that the whole might be split into halves at will, and readily made whole again, one enormous side sliding back and forth on a short track. In the two undivided faces of the cube, relatively squaring the center, were four borings, somewhat smaller in diameter than an ordinary pencil, and extending through, and directly in the center was focused a network of insulated wires which dropped down out of the gloom overhead. In the other two sides of the great cube, just where the dividing lines of the halves came, were the funnel-like mouths of a two-inch boring. This, too, extended straight through. Directly opposite each of the two mouths, a dozen feet away, was mounted a peculiarly heavy gun of the naval type. In a general sort of way, these were not unlike twelve-inch ordnance, but the breech was much larger in proportion, the barrel longer, and the bore only two instead of twelve inches. 
The mountings were high, and the adjustment so delicate, that looking into the open breech of one gun, the bore through the twenty-foot cube, and through the barrel of the gun on the other side, seemed to be continuous. "'This is the diamond-making machine, gentlemen,' said Mr. Wynne, and he indicated to Mr. Latham, Mr. Schultz, and Mr. Zenke, the cube and the two guns. It is perfectly simple in construction, has enormous powers of resistance, as you may guess, and is as delicately fitted as a watch, being regulated by electric power. This cube is the solution of the high-pressure, high-temperature problem, which was only one of the many seemingly insuperable obstacles to be overcome. When the bolts are withdrawn, one half slides back. When the bolts are in position, it is as solid as if it were one piece, and, perfectly able to withstand a force greater than the ingenuity of man, has ever before been able to contrive. This force is a combination of a heat, one half that of the sun on its surface, and a head-on impact of two one-hundred-pound projectiles fired less than forty feet apart, with an enormous charge of cordite, and possessing an initial velocity greater than was ever recorded in gunnery. This vast force centers in a sort of furnace in the middle of the cube. The furnace is round, about three feet long, and three feet in diameter, built of half a dozen fire-resisting substances in layers, perforated for electric wires, with an opening through it lengthwise of the exact size and borings in the gun and in the cube. It fits snugly into a receptacle cut out for it in the center of the cube, and is intended to protect the steel of the cube proper from the intense heat. This heat reaches the furnace by electric wires, which enter the cube from the sides, as you see, being brought here by a conduit along the river bed from a large power plant five miles away. Twenty-eight large wires are necessary to bring it. I own the power plant, ostensibly for the operation of a small sugar refinery. I may add that the furnace is a variation of the principle employed by Mr. Moisson in Paris. He turned to Mr. Zenke. You may remember having heard me mention him. I remember, the expert acquiesced grimly. Now, pure carbon is vaporized, as you perhaps know, at a fraction less than 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit, Mr. Wynne continued. A carbon not merely chemically pure, but absolutely pure, in highly compressed disks, is packed in the furnace, the furnace placed within the cube, the ends of the two-inch opening in the furnace being blocked to prevent expansion, the cube is closed, the bolts fastened, and heat applied for several minutes. A heat, gentlemen, of 5,280 degrees Fahrenheit. The heat of the sun is only about 10,000 degrees. And then the pressure of about 7,000 tons to the square inch is added by means of the two guns. In other words, gentlemen, pure carbon, vaporized, is caught between two projectiles which enter the cube simultaneously from opposite sides, being fired by electricity. The impact is so terrific that what had been two feet of compressed carbon is instantly condensed into an irregular disk, one inch or an inch and a half thick. And that disk, gentlemen, is a diamond." The violence of the operation, coupled with the intense heat, fuses everything. Furnace, projectiles, electric wires, fire brick, even asbestos, into a single mass. The cube is opened, and this mass, white hot, is dropped into cold water. This increases the pressure until the mass is cool. Then it is broken away, and in the center is a diamond and as big as a biscuit, gentlemen. Four small bores lead from the two-inch bore through the cube, and permit the escape of air as the projectiles enter. There is no rebound because the elastic quality of the carbon is crushed out of existence, driven, I might say, into the diamond itself. Of course the furnace, the two projectiles, and the connecting electric wires are all destroyed at each charge, 
which brings the total cost of the operation to a little more than eight hundred dollars, including nearly three tons of brown sugar. The diamond resulting is worth at least a million when broken up for cutting, sometimes even two millions. That is all, I think. There was a long, awed silence. Mr. Latham, leaning against the giant cube, stared thoughtfully at his toes. Mr. Schultz was peering curiously about him, thence off into the gloom. Mr. Zenke still had a question. "'I understand that all the diamonds were made in that disc-like shape,' he remarked at last. "'Then the uncut stones that were stolen were—' "'They were natural stones,' interrupted Mr. Wynne, "'imported for purposes of study and experiment.' I told Chief Arkwright the truth, but not all of it. In the last twenty years Mr. Kellner had destroyed some twenty thousand dollars' worth of diamonds in this way. I may add that while Mr. Kellner had succeeded in making diamonds of large size, he had never made a perfect one until eight years ago. But meanwhile the expenses of the work, as you will understand, were enormous. So during the past eight years— about a million dollars' worth of diamonds have been sold, one or two at a time, to meet this expense. He paused a moment, then resumed musingly, All this, you understand, is not the work of a day. Mr. Kellner was nearly eighty-one years old, and it was fifty-eight years ago that he began work here. The cubes there were made and placed in position thirty years ago. The guns have been there for twenty-eight years. So long, in fact, that recollection of them has passed from the minds of men who made them. And, until four years ago, he was assisted by his son, Miss Kellner's father and brother. There was some explosion in this chamber where we stand which killed them both, and since then he has worked alone. His son, Miss Kellner's father, was the inventor of the machine which has enabled us to cut all the stones I showed you. I mailed the application for patent on this machine to Washington three days ago. It is as intricate as a linotype, and as delicate as a chronometer, but it does the work of fifty expert hand-cutters. Until patent papers are granted, I must ask that I be allowed to protect that. Mr. Latham turned upon him quickly. But you've explained all this to us fully, he exclaimed sharply, indicating the cube and the guns. We could duplicate that if we liked. Yes, you could, Mr. Latham, replied Mr. Wynne slowly, but you can't duplicate the brain that isolated absolutely pure carbon from the charred residue of brown sugar. That brain was Mr. Kellner's. The secret died with him. Again there was a long silence, broken at last by Mr. Schultz. That means no more diamonds can be made, until someone else can make the pure carbon. Yah, and that brings us down to the question, how many diamonds are made already? The diamonds I showed you, gentlemen, were all that have been cut thus far, replied Mr. Wynne. Less than twenty of the discs were used in making them. There are now some five hundred more of these discs in existence, roughly a billion dollars' worth, so you see, I am prepared to hold you to my proposition that you buy one hundred million dollars' worth of them at one-half the carat price you now pay in the open market. Mr. Latham passed one hand across a brow, bedewed with perspiration, and stared helplessly at the German. The work of cutting could go on steadily here, under the direction of Mr. Zenke, Mr. Wen resumed after a moment. The secrecy of this place has not been violated for forty years. We are now one hundred and seventy feet below ground level, in a gallery of the abandoned coal-mine, which gave Coaldale its name, reached underground from the cellar in the cottage. Roofs and walls of the entire place are shored up to ensure safety, and heavy felts make this chamber soundproof, smothering even the detonation of the guns. Mr. Zenke is the man to do the work. Mr. Kellner, for ten years, held him to be the first expert in the world, and it would be carrying out his wishes if Mr. Zenke would agree. 
If he does not, I shall undertake it and flood the market. His voice hardened a little. And gentlemen, call off your detectives. The secret is now more yours than mine. It destroys you if it becomes known, not me. The New York police have turned this end of the investigation over to the local police, and they are fools. All the forms have been complied with, so this place is safe. Now call off your men. On the day the last diamond is delivered to you, and the payment of one hundred million dollars is completed, everything here will be destroyed. That's all. One hundred million dollars, repeated Mr. Latham. Even if we accept the proposition, Schultz, how can we raise that enormous sum within a year and preserve the secret? It isn't a question of can, Latham. It's a question of must, was the reply. He thoughtfully regarded Mr. Wynne. It's only Sunday night, and we have until Thursday to answer, remember? He turned to Mr. Latham with a recurrence of whimsical philosophy. Think of it, Latham. The alchemists tried for three thousand years to make a piece of gold so big as a needle point, and didn't. And he made diamonds as big as your fist with a little cordite and some electricity. Mine got, man. Think of it. The jewelers accepted Mr. Wynne's proposition. Mr. Wynne bowed his thanks and handed Mr. Zenke a scientific periodical opened at a page which bore a headline, Newly Discovered Property of Radium. Diamonds, rubies, emeralds, and sapphires changed in color by exposure of one month to radium. For the fourth time Red Haney underwent the third degree. It culminated in a full confession of the murder of Mr. Kellner. There had been no accomplice. "'You see, Chief,' he explained apologetically, "'you and that other guy,' meaning Mr. Burns, "'was so dead set on saying there was somebody else in it, "'and was so ready with your descriptions, "'that it looked good to me, and I said, sure. "'But I done it.'" End of chapter 17 End of the Diamond Master by Jacques Futrelle Read for you by Don Larson, 1989-1990